Welcome to the Bayesian Conspiracy. I'm Ian Ashbrodsky. I'm Steven Zuber. And, oh shit, no Jace today. <laughs> no Jace. Jace is out sick, so it's just the two of us. Uh, we apologize in advance to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for covering that base, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we are, well, we're going back to our roots today, but I guess before that we have some feedback. So let's hit the feedback. Let's do it. I saw it. looks like fun. Uh, regarding our earlier episode on, uh, the Jugad ethics, uh, Wes says that he went to an ACX organizers retreat in Berkeley, uh, the previous weekend. And one of the rules in the onboarding documents was no making romantic or sexual advances. He asks, is this admitting defeat in the sexual revolution question? Uh, I think it is. Yes. That was my thought. I, I'm not even, you know, I'm off. I don't, I don't, I don't even play this game. And I, I see that if they're making a blanket rule, that seems like the 2009 James Randi amazing meeting in Vegas, uh, which was like the year after Elevator Gate. Hmm. Then I think uh, it seems like they're conceding defeat. And the the solution to this seems so obvious that I'm amazed that this didn't happen with the meeting of rationalists. What is the Check solution? here if you're okay with being sexual with being advanced upon, oh. and we'll give you a a little <laughs> sticker to put on your name tag. Eh. You know, I'm open for business, right? <laughs> I, I suppose. Is uh, that exactly the kind of shit we would do? It is, <laughs> ish. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that sounds right up r- rationalist alley. If I, if I do say so myself, it does. But uh, that is that is not how things work. If you uh, apparently want to have a well run meeting. I don't know. I mean, I'm all for making people comfortable and stuff. And maybe this isn't the place people go to hook up. I'm not sure what a meter's organization is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, organizer's retreat, I mean. I'm, so, I'm sure it's not supposed to be a place to hook up, no. But also, you know, what you do after hours used to be your own business. Yeah. I guess, like, if if, if you want to go and you're like, do I really want to be hit on? Ah, I don't feel like going to the ACX retreat then. Like, yeah. I get that. But then... Then you just don't put the pink sticker on your on your name tag. No. I think this is a solvable problem. Well, bring, bring, might, it, bring this idea to the next meeting. You can have it for free. Then there might be a stigma of either having or not having one of those. We should be above that, too. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I, I do think it is, yeah, like you said, just a, a tacit admission that uh, the new sexual ethics didn't work and go back to no one has sex. <laughs> it just seems like there's there's a really shiny bright third alternative here yeah which yeah. is an opt-in system i mean maybe they'll try it at the next one try it with the next one Excellent. let me know it turns out let me know it turns out uh hobo demon speaking on the 10th man rule which uh we talked about this was in regards to one of the less wrong posts right yeah yeah that uh if there's nine people at uh, this part of the military ah. Israeli military doctrine that if uh, nine people all agree without dissenting on a course of action, then the tenth one has to disagree. Uh, Hobo Demon says, on the tenth man rule, a form overcoming asks conformity was a side benefit. The main sell was that they were in adversarial relations, and being unable to spot arguments against a course of action is evidence that your adversary has conned you into considering it. It has. It seems like it's a win-win. You know, the only downside I could I can see is that. If it's actually a really good idea, all ten people should agree with it, right? Sure, but if you're if you know that the you have an enemy who is trying to mislead you, uh, trying to make you make mistakes because it would be to their advantage, then uh, maybe worry that they might have done such a good job that everybody is on board with this thing. I really like that idea. Yeah. It's just extra paranoid, and this has to have just caveats for sanity, right? Like. If you see 400 people coming over the hill and you're like, well, we're 10 strong, we're going to be killed. I think we should retreat. And then number number 10 has to be like, well, actually, I think there's a really good case we made for standing our ground here and saying we can win this. Yeah. I think that uh, I would I would think that guy is a Confederate spy, right? right. <laughs> yeah. And then finally, more dinner mail, uh, our friend Matt from the podcast. This was in relation to the uh, noblesse oblige or the people who have unearned advantages have an obligation to help out uh the people who have unearned disadvantages right okay and then we there's there's some obvious confusion there about what earned means but setting that aside i like what matt has to say here go on matt had this suggestion for how to uh even things out he says what if some kind of system where the rich lend almost all of their money to people who are trying to create excess value to society and if those p- people succeed in generating value for society, then those rich people accrue some fraction of that value, which they just continue lending out again. He just invented Shark Tank. <laughs> he just invented capitalism. 
I, I do believe that was his his joke. Yes. Well, uh, I think very specifically, it's it's exactly like Shark Tank. You go there and you present to five or six people. Hey, I've got this funny idea or this good idea, or I've made some money, but I need you know an influx of cash. Here's ten percent of my business for I don't know two hundred thousand dollars, and then of course they, the sharks get to sit there and bicker about percentages and. One guy always wants a royalty in perpetuity for like whatever it is that he's investing in. Mm. Like I want a dollar per unit for fucking ever. Okay. And I hate those kind of. I mean, I, I'm I'm getting worked up about it because I feel like that's shisty as fuck. Okay. It's okay. like you don't get ten percent and a, perpetu- a, a a perpetual uh, royalty for my for my thing. What are you kidding me? Yeah. Yeah. You you, you get to you get a single choice here mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. also forever fuck you well how am i, how am I gonna recoup my loss all right how about a royalty till you recoup your your investment and then you get 10 percent. no still you don't get to i don't know anyway uh i like i like matt's idea here i think i think there's something to it i take it that guy is not mark cuban because you love mark cuban right this guy is uh kevin bacon. his last name huh kevin bacon oh no he's he's chill okay. uh, they call him mr wonderful because that's that's his name on the show but not like they all have personas, but that's like his brand. Okay. okay. Uh, I can't remember his last name. No, Cuban's fun. Um, the and, one, yeah. The one downside with uh, Matt's thing here is that while it does make all of society richer, uh, it, the the value taken from the noblesse, from the nobles, from the advantaged people, I guess, uh, only goes to those who have the ability to create excess value to society. So uh, people who just are crippled or whatever don't have the ability to create to produce more than they consume would be uh would be left out of this particular scenario yeah. i would modify though... it a bit the what i would modify it a bit it says that where the a system where the rich lend almost all of their money mm-hmm. i would say lend much of their money mm-hmm. and then some of the rest can go to supporting people who can't be invested in right? right you know what yeah. i mean yeah. Like a, a social safety net sort of thing. Right, right. Yeah. Some sort of government organization. Yeah. You, you need people in charge to, you know, collect this and distribute it to people who need it. So. Uh, what would we call that system? It's hard to say. <laughs> okay. What was the bank called? Gringotts. Yeah. That's what we'll call it. Gringotts. Yeah. I don't like that name. It yeah, reminds it's... me of short, ugly things. That fits. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no one likes the bean counters, but you need those beans counted. So It's true. <laughs> Alrighty, well, um, that was all the feedback. Should we go on to our main subject? Uh, we got the uh, last wrong posts first, or do we do those? We do those at the end. We always do those at the end. Always being like in the last few months, right? Wow. Yeah, I just I, I forevermore, forevermore. Yes, it always has been this way, and it always will be. That's right. Cool. Okay, it was just next in the notes. Yeah. I see. All right. Well, yeah, that works for me. Let's do it. All right, so we were going to have more of a freeform discussion here, uh, which makes it harder with Jace not being here. But, uh, you know, you and me weekly have freeform discussions for hours on end. So I, I think we can pull this off. And at least this is unexplored terrain, so. Yeah. Uh, so we, near the very beginning of the podcast, talked about a bunch of rationalist stuff that rationalists are the core brand identity is about things like um, cryonics, machine intelligence, the coming singularity, that kind of stuff. And since then, we've spread out a lot into other things of interest to rationalists, right? If it starts getting some play, we're like, hey, this is interesting. Let's talk about it. But we're going back to our roots today. We're, we're going back to the coming singularity and uh, what we do in the face of the future, because it has been big recently. Uh, we had an episode, I don't know, three, four months ago when GPT-3 came out and then Dolly and all the new machine learning stuff was unveiled for the public and everybody gasped because of how much it had advanced and pretty much everybody shortened their timelines to when uh, we're going to get AGI uh, artificial general intelligence basically computers that can do as thinking as good as humans can and as robustly as humans can a lot of people were thinking like you know 50 years out and drop that down to 30 or or less and I was reading Scott Alexander's most recent post on again slightly against uh, underpopulation worries where he was talking about the fact that uh, population is shrinking in basically every country that isn't in sub-Saharan Africa. And even those are showing major slowdowns. And so uh, it's likely that the human population is going to start shrinking in a a few decades. uh, By 2100, it'll be reducing uh, definitely. And one of the key things that he said in that post is 2100 isn't a real year uh, because we're going to get AGI before then. Uh, and when that happens, things are going to change so drastically 
that it's hard to even predict what human life is going to be like. Like, if, if our issue in 2100 is that we are still limited by the number of humans there are or by the IQ that people are born with, then we're completely fucked because that, that's not how this is going to happen. Likewise, Robin... Robin? Robert? Well, Wiblin from the 80,000 Hours organization, a big EA organization, said uh, recently in Facebook, posted about this shortening of timelines and said, hey, everybody, go out, enjoy your time with your kids, do the things you always wanted to do with your life while you're still around to do it. Because after the... End of the in, world. <laughs> I don't want to say end of the world. After the machine intelligence revolution, where the economy is going to be changed on orders of magnitude, 100 times, maybe 1,000 times changes in prices, values, what, how things can be produced, how humans work biologically, um, it, it'll be, you know, who knows? We, we may all be dead, in which case it'd be great that we spent that time with our kids, or we may all be transhumaned into a crazy utopia that we're all uploaded in, in which case all this, you know, striving over the past two decades wouldn't have mattered and we would have been better off spending that time with our kids. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that, that kind of got me thinking. When we do podcasts about things like culture war topics or, uh, or the, like the Jugat ethics from earlier, do those matter much? How do we, uh, how do we look at the world? with this upcoming massive change sometime in the next decade or two. I see them mattering in the same way as like, you know, per the advice of hang out with your kids and stuff. And when I say end of the world, I mean like the end of the world as we know it. Yeah. Not necessarily like the sun blowing up. Right. right? Um, Just unpredictable from here. What we'd even look like. Yeah. As a society and as possibly humans. It will be, yeah. Presumably unrecognizable to the world today. So, uh, no, I mean, so, you know, if the advice taken generally is like, you know, spend time with your kids, do things you enjoy. Um, part of that is figuring out the stuff you enjoy, how to best approach it, kind of what sort of life and intellectual and ethical framework you want to operate within and outside of, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, and just having fun. You know, like, so if we're, if we're, like, culture war stuff, if we're talking about that, that's more just, like, fun. Yeah. Um, I don't expect anything really to come of that. You know, the, the Jugat ethics thing is sort of like a, that's a philosoph that's a philosophy topic, really. And if you're like, oh, I've noticed this, this is something I can actually change about my own thinking or this or that, that's kind of the point, right? Well, we but just had, we just had that episode on labor law and what's that going to matter in 10 years and how much was it really going to affect people's lives to have opinions on labor law at all? Well, I'll tell you what to do for the next 10 years, you know? Um, and 10 years is a pretty low end guess. Yeah. You know, so I think. Could be 20 or 30. I mean, who knows? Yeah. You know, I, I think that it's entirely likely, just because I trust the opinions of the smart people that I know, that it's, you know, sooner rather than later. But, um, you know, I, I, I still like, uh, uh, the advice of when in doubt, bet on things staying the same. You know, like, I still save money, mm -hmm. right? You yeah. presumably are still saving money. Yeah. Um, to the best that you can because, well, what if this whole, you know, end of the world thing doesn't work out in my favor? I want to be able to eat in 30 years, you know? Yeah. Um, so I think you still, you still want to do that. And then, then it's a matter of like, all right, well, then how much do I update my behavior based on like this vague thing that will probably maybe happen in the next 50 years? Yeah. You know? Um, I'll just point out that, you know, have fun and hang out with your kids and do things you enjoy is good advice whether or not the world is ending in the next 100 years, you know? Yeah, but it changes <laughs> it, it changes how you're going to do things. Um uh Charlie worked with a Jehovah's Witness lady for a while and uh she said that uh she was told by everybody and and for this reason she didn't uh wasn't bothering to buy a house because like why save up money and put down a down payment and all that when the end of the world is coming soon? Like what's it matter? And you know, I I I came from a cult slash religion hard to say which right now i think it's in flux uh that predicted the end of the world at a specific date two separate times and uh both times that was kind of disastrous for the people in it in the religion and i don't feel comfortable just being like you know what maybe uh change everything you're doing but on the other hand if you're putting a lot of effort into stuff like labor law or things that aren't going to affect your immediate survival your your basic comfort level 
seems possibly misplaced priority. I would at least add into that priority list your medium term like happiness. Yeah. You know, so it's like, yeah, be sure you can pay your bills at the end of the month, but also make sure that the you of five years from now is healthy and happy to the best that you can, you know? Yeah. Don't take up a dangerous drug habit because, well, there's only, you know, six months left in the world, right? Because mm-hmm. right? then we sound more like a doomsday cult. Right. And the difference is, of course, like, we're not saying, well, when the meteorite behind this, or when the spaceship behind this meteorite comes by, we're all going to be beamed onto the ship. Yeah. You know, it's it's a little less crazy than that. Um, I mean, I'm not about to liquidate my investments and start partying because <laughs> that just sounds stupid. I want to, I want to keep investing as if I'm going to be living at least another hundred years, right? That's sort of my plan. Yeah, but on the other hand, also, I think maybe I shouldn't get as worked up about silly things that don't have huge long-term impacts, like generous or extravagant spending of money or something or like like almost anything political oh that too like short of things that actually kill people like wars it's like what what does it matter which party's in control they pretty soon won't matter at all i guess we'll beat on this for a couple more minutes and then i this is a good time to kind of keep in mind anna solomon's solomon i can't talk uh (laughs) her, her post on less wrong but we'll put that put a pin in that and come back to it I think that it depends. Like, some things could legitimately impact the trajectory of humanity, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's not impossible that, uh, well, it's not even unlikely that some some leaders are more likely to try and start a nuclear war than others, right? Right. So, like, you don't want them to be in charge. Definitely. Um, So, like, there there is, to the extent that, like, you can, (laughs) whatever tick up your estimate of an existential risk with certain things happening. You want those to, to be less. Yeah. But I'm thinking of like efforts to reduce factory farming or something. Yeah. Like I do think those are admirable. And I think that any, any ground made there is good. Um, and, and a huge win. Mm-hmm. Uh, I remember hearing 10 or 15 years ago that McDonald's was going to transition to like less cruelty ridden eggs in the next decade or so. So that either that, has already happened or it failed to happen. Um, and we could look it up. I my we can I guess maybe just Google where McDonald's gets their eggs or something. But I, the the vague thing I'm remembering is from like an interview with Peter Singer some ten or fifteen years ago. Um, and anyway, so like that's good. Mm-hmm. You know, for everything that doesn't suffer, and McDonald's I think is the world's largest buyer of eggs. And so like for for every drop of suffering that doesn't go into that. That's good for the next fifty years until all suffering is removed forever, right? Yeah, I still think that matters. But like, if you've got like a, if you've got a hundred and fifty year plan to, you know, your organization is going to be built for, you know, three generations of longevity to work to solve, uh, um, factory farming. Mm-hmm. Like, I do wonder if that is the best use of your time. I would at least focus on some short term wins. Yeah, you know, that to, to that effect. Like, as far as saving money and stuff, this is an important thing. And I think this also is a, m- mentioned in passing in Anna's post here. But, uh, well, at least the impetus for what I'm about to say, which is, sure, save money, plan ahead and all that. But, like, don't not have fun, you know, yeah. at the ex- at the expense of, like, well, I'll need this money in 38 years when I hit retirement. Like, mm-hmm. don't, don't do that. You know, take the trip, you know, buy the thing, you know. Save, you know, make sure you can pay your bills and, and whatever. There's there's a balance, right? Yeah. But it's not in, I'm going to have as little fun as possible, and I'm going to eat, you know, rice and beans and vitamins for 22 years, and I can retire at 45. Like, no one should be doing that, in my humble opinion. Right. You know, if if you have to retire at 50 instead of 45, and you could have all this fun in the interim, like, that's that's like probably another... Three hundred thousand dollars minimum of fun that you get to have. Yeah. Fucking do it. Yeah. You know. Like, you know. Maybe I'm really lucky that I don't like having fun because <laughs> I saved a lot of money not spending it doing things that other people consider fun. I guess. I mean, I guess it depends what you mean by fun. I mean, like I buy video games and I yeah, bought a PS5, yeah. um, but you know, I don't go to like to a lot of concerts or on a lot of trips. Although I want to do more trips eventually. I need to figure out how to how does one plan trips, uh, but I don't know. I think that's just something that I've had kind of in the back of my mind for the last while is like do stuff, 
because you might not get you might not get a chance to. Yeah. You know, you could get hit by a bus or the world could end. Yeah. And you'll be like, oh man, I never got to do the thing. Well, uh, if you're dead, you won't care that you never got to do the thing. Well. But while you're alive, it'd be nice to do the thing. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, you know, to put a finer point on it, if the bus doesn't kill you right away, but you get like, you know, two weeks to be like, shit, I didn't do all the stuff I wanted to do. Yeah. That sucks. Yeah. And yeah. you don't, you don't want that to happen. You should be able to be like, oh, I did all the shit, you know, or at least I did some of the stuff. It's weird. The, like part of the, the trans panic thing is, uh, people saying, well, some of these are cis kids that are being put on HRT and it's going to ruin their lives going forward. The trans what thing? Trans panic thing? Panic. I think yeah. it's a trans pana. Oh, no, 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 no like, panic. Is that a new word? I yeah. stick all these new words. All right. And, I mean, I can see that being, like, a legitimate concern if life is going to continue on for a long time. But, you know what? It, if in 20, 30 years we get full morphological freedom, then even people who kind of fucked up their bodies and are unhappy with them, uh, because it turns out they, they weren't trans, uh, you'll be able to change your body to anything you want in 20 years. So, not that big a deal. Either that or we're all dead in 20 years. So, again, not that big a deal. That just sounds like, I mean, to be Does it sound like nihilism? To be fair, no, it just sounds like every religious cult ever, right? It does, Well, Jesus it? will be here in five years. Don't worry about it, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, so, I, and I get this is different, but, you know, part of our, part of our job as, as rationalists is as the community is to sell this to the public. Right. And that is not a very persuasive message to, <laughs> to any sane public person, right? Yeah. So, that doesn't, doesn't mean that the, the premise is wrong. It just means that the pitch needs some some fine tuning. Needs some work. And All right. How about I, I would, this? I would say that like if if your quality of life is diminished for the next twenty years, that's a drag. It is, and, and you should yeah. make steps for that not to happen. On the plus side, how about this? What if your quality of life is diminished due to you know some kind of accident or something, and you're thinking, what's even the point? But if you hang on for another twenty years, you get to the awesome transhuman future where you can completely change your body or whatever you want. So kind of worth sticking out for those 20 years for that that's that's the positive spin and uh i think there's something to be said for that like i think i mentioned before but you know even like when my you know and i, I guess i always feel bad talking about like my depression like it was a serious thing yeah. i i mean everyone's stuff is serious to them and i you know i'm not belittling my stuff but like i i guess i've, I've had mild depression for most of my adult life mm -hmm. and even when it's at its worst i was never like all right that's it i'm gonna just end it i'm like okay no that's it i'm gonna just give up and then ride out the rest of my life until I can, you know, get to the get to the part where this is fixable, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, that was always kind of like my 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 retreat plan, um, you know. So there's something for that, I guess. I guess it also would motivate people to take heroic steps to save lives, like someone who is completely fucked. Uh, might. It might be worth spending insane amounts of resources keeping them going for another few years because then they might get to get to the transhuman future instead of dying early. Chronics is another avenue for that. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, you, you bite the social awkward bullet of signing up for Chronics and spending somewhere between 30 and 60 bucks a month on a life insurance policy. And, uh, you know, you get this somewhere between 1% and 15% chance of being rev rev revived in the future if you die now yeah um that becomes a much saner bet if you think like you've got an estimate for when the world's gonna end um end in a good way i should change my verbiage um <laughs> but when the world's gonna dramatically alter yeah i don't know so part of part of the trouble here is like how to plan for vague emergencies right yeah and there's there's a couple of other good corollaries to this but uh there's a post on Less Wrong we'll link to by Anna Solomon um, called What Should You Change in Response to an Emergency, in quotes, and AI Risk. Mm -hmm. And so I think part of it is spent defining, like, what, what do you mean by emergency, right? Yeah. And there's definitely a difference between, like, <laughs> you know, the population decline of 2100, yeah. uh, which, as Scott Alexander points out, isn't a real year. It's reminiscent of the John Mulaney bit he talked about when he was signing for a mortgage. Mm. And it's like, and here's where your last payment will be in, you know, 2047. And he's like, that's not a real year. <laughs> <laughs> like, <laughs> it's interesting. Scott Alexander said even 2050 is starting to sound like a fake year. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Mulaney wasn't, you know, thinking in terms of singularity. It was just like, that. that's so ridiculously long from now that yeah. we're going to be writing you a check for $1,400 in, you know, January 1st. Right. So. It's uh, at that point, probably put $1,400 in a gumball machine to get a gumball. Right. 
I mean, I guess this is the cool thing of a long-term loan is that the contract is there and it's very, very big and it's it's structured that it'll stay that way forever. So yeah. Um, I I liked her post. She said some of the things that you might do in the face of an emergency to tackle this emergency is things like uh, skip meals or skip sleep, and uh, uh, you know the the contrast there being if your emergency is one to two decades out, you can't skip meals for <laughs> decades. <laughs> you can't even skip meals for weeks. So uh, the, the, there's there's different levels of emergency. Principle one of emergency planning is that time matters or time scale matters. Yeah. You know, if uh, if your house is on fire, your decisions you make right this second will really, really matter. That's when you do skip your meal. That's when you, you know, well, I was making lunch, but I, I guess I could skip it, you know, yeah. to get out the important shit out of my house. Yeah. Um, you know, if uh, you're worried about, you know, climate change, like another good example, you know, mm. vague bad shit's going to happen in the next few decades, centuries. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's not good, but right. how the hell do you plan for that? You don't buy coastal property, and that's about all you can do, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, unless you're doing anything else to brace yourself for climate change. Not I, climate Buy an air conditioning yeah. unit, even if you don't think you need one. Yeah. yeah. Um, But other than that, I can't think of anything I'm doing. I mean, so much of that depends on society still existing. Like, uh... My air conditioning unit isn't going to do shit for me if there isn't a power generator running in Colorado. So a lot of it is just making sure society doesn't collapse. So maybe another thing you could do, I mean, it's not a permanent solution, but you could buy a generator, you know, to have yeah. in the garage that you pull out in case of emergency. It's a very short-term solution as well. That yeah. wouldn't even last you, you know, a week. Yeah, you need to be trolling around the neighborhood with a shotgun looking for gas. <laughs> but This is my vehicle now. Yeah, I... uh yeah, so I mean, time scale matters. That that's that's a big one. I like that. That's an important caveat. Um, principle two: It matters how much we know to do, or, or it matters how much we know how to address the emergency. Yeah, and that's kind of what we're hitting on here. Is I know fuck all about what to do, what I can do about climate change. You know, what I know what I can do to plan my life. Again, not buy coastal property. Mm -hmm. But I think that's all I can do personally. Like I can do my little things that I can, you know, I can buy energy efficient light bulbs or whatever to diminish my impact. But let's be real, I'm not causing climate change. I could try my whole life to make a dent in it one way or another, and I couldn't do anything. I think if I dedicated all of my life's resources to like making climate change happen sooner, I could probably do that yeah. by like blowing up, you know, oil tankers or something. Right, right. Um, but let's be real, you know, the, the giant companies that are spilling oil into the Gulf of Mexico are the ones causing it faster than I ever could, so. And, I mean, honestly, the, the climate change is caused by the burning of the fuel. So whether the oil tanker burns in the in the Gulf Coast or burns in people's gas tanks, well, I guess then they would have to pull out even more oil to put in people's gas tanks, but yeah, it's not. Well, and, like, I'm just saying, like, one giant inferno that you get every five or ten years with every one of these giant spills right, yeah. is way worse than, like, all the gas of all the cars I'd ever drive if I lived to be a million years old. I got a question. Yeah. What are things we could do uh, in relation to this vague, somewhat futurish kind of, quotes, emergency? Because I remember back in 2007 when I was first reading these things on Less Wrong, it was very obvious what we could do, which is things like uh, spread the word, make people aware of this, uh, start a research foundation, donate money to it. And we have succeeded with flying colors. Uh, everyone is now aware of the AI uh, safety problem. Some people don't think it's a problem, but they're at least aware that other people do think it's a problem. There is large foundations, more than one, that get lots of money to research this. Like, it feels like we won in that regard. Obviously, the human race hasn't won because they're still working on it. But the people who are us that don't have the expertise to work on this directly... And don't have, you know, billions of dollars to donate in a large way. Is there anything we can continue to do? There's probably still some marginal benefit from getting more people on board. Okay. You know, like that way if somehow it ever falls to public opinion, we'll, we're more public, more of the public will be informed. But mm. um, you're right. I, I mean, as far as the, the main organiz organizations I know of don't have funding issues anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, like, they could probably use more money. Everyone always wants more money, but... At some point, it's just going to their whatever uh, r runway of of money, right? Yeah. Like, you're not helping solve the problem now. You're helping keeping them solving it in 30 years, 31 right. years. It's like, well, I don't really care about them solving it in 31 years, right? Yeah. So, uh, I honestly don't know. I, I, I think that, not to give virtually no thought to an important question, but I think it's a lot like the climate change thing. I think, like, I'm pr I've probably done everything I can. 
And other than keep talking sanely to people about it whenever the opportunity, not whenever the opportunity comes up, but, you know, once in a while when it can come up. Um, I was just reading a Twitter thread by someone who works in AI policy, and I'll link it in the show notes, uh, where he he said a bunch of things like, the people in government don't have the knowledge or the ability to change any of the, uh, any of this to make impactful AI policy decisions. And on the one hand, like, sure, maybe we could get uh, younger people or at least more technologically knowledgeable people in government. I, I think that's probably a good step forward. But also, he made some very compelling points that government just isn't uh, doesn't have the capacity to to regulate this sort of thing. This is all done. Uh, by mega corporations that can have tens of thousands of GPUs working in clusters for the research, and like even universities aren't doing this research anymore. And what what is the government going to do? They don't, unless you can. <laughs> I believe he said unless you can have complete information transparency between the U.S. and China, and also monitor all the computations on all the computers of the world all the time, do, do, what what difference does what your policy is going to make? And you know, for him, this was like a, oh my God, this sucks. We got to do something about this situation. But for me, I'm just like, first of all, maybe that's good. But also secondly, how the fuck could you even change any of that? I don't want to live in a totalitarian world state. Uh, do you remember? Oh, you never saw Captain America's Civil War, did you? Uh, did I see it? That's not Winter Soldier. No, that, that was the one where Tony and Steve basically get their own posses and they're fighting it out in that fun airport battle. Oh, I saw the airport battle, but I didn't see the rest of the movie. All right, well, so, so they're... I was they, kind of disappointed by the airport battle. I mean, they're not going to kill each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and also they specifically went to duke it out at an airport because no civilians would be hurt because it was abandoned. And I'm like, I, this feels like the Jets and the uh, Sharks meeting to rumble somewhere, you know? Like, it, it doesn't feel like serious stakes. Yeah, it was more just like, we're here to stop you. And it's like, you're not going to stop us, and you're not going to kill us, so we're going to get out of here. And that's how how it works. But anyway, I bring it up because Steve, so Cap's position is that, you know, our personal freedoms matter, and it's not worth signing those away because some government bureaucrat thinks they know better than you, right? Uh, If they tell us to do the wrong thing or they send us out too late, like, what's the point of us even being around? Mm -hmm. And then Tony's thing is like, well, A traumatized by all the shit that he's seen would be like you're all obsessed with your precious freedoms but if we had a cool safety net around the world we'd be protected from all this shit right yeah um what good are your freedoms going to do you when you're dead exactly and that that all comes to head when thanos shows up and this all sounds like it's 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 aside from the point but it's right on the nose which is like this this actually could relate to you know the next you know we're talking like 20 year planning kind of thing Mm -hmm. well if you're okay living in a totalitarian regime that you know you have no freedoms or whatever but you get a 50% likely likelihood increase of, like, a safe future, mm-hmm. maybe it's worth it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, granted, I don't know how to press the button that turns into a, into a successful totalitarian regime. I think it would be easier to press a button, or not press a button, but easier to make it happen where things are an unsuccessful totalitarian regime, which is where you get all the downsides and none of the good sides. I um, think a large part of it would be throwing the game to China, because they seem to be doing totalitarianism right in quotes <laughs> i mean not a society i want to live in but it is functional and also apparently they are leveraging what ai they can uh that they do have access to for mass technologically aided surveillance so uh you know if you wanted that totalitarian world i think handing the reins over to china would work or would be a step in that in the correct direction i wouldn't even really know how to make that happen though does just the president of the United States walk over to... Uh, no, because you'd never get the American public on board with it. You'd have to do some kind of internal sabotage. I guess that's the thing is you wouldn't need them to be on board once, you know, your robot army turned on them and said, you know, comply or be vanquished. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Uh, I guess... I guess if you really wanted to sabotage the U.S., you would sow discord among its citizens so that they were spending more energy uh, and attention fighting each other rather than fighting outside threats. Maybe introduce a new religion that captures half the people. That sounds like it's already happening. <laughs> not, not to there, there's there's a particular reason I chose this phrasing. Yes, not not to fasten my tinfoil hat on, but it fits rather snugly in this conversation. Yeah. Um, 
when he mentioned this guy works in AI policy, my first thought was like, oh, that sucks. Before he even said what he had to say. Yeah. And like, that sounds like such a drag of job because you're trying to argue to a bunch of people who are like, I can't get the email to work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I remember, remember, you remember like, uh, where they dragged like John Dorsey or Jack Dorsey, I mean, or maybe it was someone from Facebook or both in the last, what do you call it? Presidential term. I vaguely, there, there, there they asked him that question about Twitter and he's like, I don't know. I work in Facebook, something along those lines. Probably, some, I'm sure that happened too. But there was one of like, you know, why does stuff keep coming up when you Google me? Why does bad stuff keep coming up? And it's like, because you're doing bad stuff. <laughs> right. And it's like, you want if you want bad stuff not to come up, you need to stop doing it. Yeah. Um, so like, this is the level of technological prowess we're dealing with, and we're trying to convince these people about an imminent AGI risk. Yeah. Like, that's just never going to happen, right? Yeah. So this 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 heroic martyr who is going to you know try and argue with these people, more power to him. Fingers crossed, but. I would not fancy myself in that battle. Yeah. Um, but even if you were, the, the, the government just doesn't have the capacity to to do that. Yeah, that's, that's the other thing is even if you had everybody's ear and you could convince them of stuff, what I could mean, you possibly... I guess you could send in the military to all the major research centers because, I mean, again, they have to have thousands of GPUs running in a cluster to do this sort of research. So there's there's a number of known sites where it happens and then, I don't know, Tell them not to do it or something. Shoot the shoot the servers. Shoot. Um, <laughs> yeah, but you know, I I would think it'd just be fairly easy to move that. You know, it's, it's equipment. You could move it off. You know, off out of the country. Sure, but and then, if, then if, the military could follow it and then start a world war over it. But or, or they could just you know drone you, like when when the military doesn't like someone in a foreign country, they drone them. Yeah, a lot of these awesome servers that, or a lot of these awesome uh, whatever data banks and all this stuff is underground. Mm -hmm. You need you need a heavy drone, maybe something that exploded with like the the force of a nuclear weapon, for example. Uh, but they got didn't they recently get a bunker that was deep underground with a drone? I first like with a penetrating strike to blow off the cover, and then a second kill shot afterwards. That's baller as hell, and probably okay. Um, I think that's but, where they got the idea for it from uh, from that new Maverick movie. I really hope they're not drawing ideas for military adventures from movies. But... No, no, no. Other way around. Oh, good. I was going to say. Yeah. Maverick um, pulled it. From... I, at least I'm assuming. I mean, that's what I would do. Yeah. You know, I guess, especially if drones are, you know, you're a government. They're super cheap. You just throw as many as it takes to put a dent in the wall and then get one through the... I mean... Yeah. Anyway. I don't know. So, I mean, you're saying what what can one do about the impending AI risk? Like, in our day-to-day? -day? Yeah. I guess as a society, maybe the Butlerian Jihad, but... uh Short of that, what individually could we do? Honestly, have fun, live your life, plan on things. I mean, I, I would say do nothing and just plan on like, plan on things staying the same for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, with you know whatever some I do think percentage that's... of risk allocated for like things will be way different. But like, I wouldn't tell somebody you know liquidate your assets and give everything to this organization because they're going to solve the problem in you know six months sooner. God no. Right. So what I else? wouldn't even say liquidate your assets and have fun. I would say like keep living as if nothing's going to change because my generally things don't change, and I know something's going to change in a major way at some point. But I think I'll be better suited to cope with it if I uh, am more responsible with my stuff beforehand. Anyway, I am not nearly. I'm not saving nearly as aggressively as I could be. Mm. It's not, I'm not like spending it. I'm just not being whatever. Super smart or or thoughtful with my with my long term retirement strategy, right? Yeah. And part of that's laziness. Another part is like I do have this back of the head concern that goes against the advice I'm offering or just throwing out without thought, which is like I still think that it seems super unlikely that in forty years or whatever, whenever whenever I feel like retiring, wait, forty years is way too long. I'm too old for that. Twenty, <laughs> thirty, who cares? Like. Society's going to be way 65 too 65 minus your current age yeah. is the, the default, although now it's trending up to like 68. Yeah. Probably but by the time we're going to retire 72, although, you know. We use in, in a very <laughs> exclusive sense, yeah. Um, but uh, the, I guess that's the, that's the thing, too, is I, I don't hate my job, my line of work, and uh, yeah. like it's not physically demanding. And it is the kind of thing I can do in diminishing amounts as the decades go on. Mm. And so, like, if I like doing it at 70, I can just keep doing it if I feel like it. Um, that said, I think it's entirely possible that GitHub Copilot 2.0 will take me out of a job. So right. um, I'm kind of worried about that. But frankly, if my job goes to the robots, 
then a lot more jobs are going to the robots. Yeah. And so something will have to happen society wide for things to not turn into immediate calamity, right? Yeah. Where <laughs> sixty million Americans pick up guns and march to to cap- to, to the capital saying fucking feed us, right? right. So something, so some. I guess I'm bringing all this up in a, in a rambling way because I don't think when I hit retirement age, things are going to be the same. Not necessarily because of AI revolution or because of global warming or whatever, but because just the current trend of, of increases, even if like things stagnated, mm-hmm. um, jobs, were, like I, I guess I'm picturing some sort of UBI will be uh, mandatory in the coming decades, right? Or they're going to just say tough shit, starve to death in the street, and we'll try to step over your bodies, you know, yeah. when the collection crew comes through. Yeah. By the way, we're hiring people for the collection crew, so some people have jobs. Um, <laughs> yeah. But like, it, did any of that make sense? I guess what I'm saying it is did. that I'm not, I guess what I'm saying is I'm not even taking my own medicine here. Right. Um, I will say um, a thing that I have been doing, which was suggested long, long ago by Robin Hansen, uh, back when he was writing Age of M and setting out the stuff for that. Uh, in his blog, one of the things he said is. Uh, if the economy multiplies just huge amounts, like he was, he was thinking a doubling time of the economy on the order of weeks, possibly days, right? Like once you have M's, the, the economy could literally double every few days. Uh, he said the people who are really going to be helped by that, who are really going to win on that are people who own little pieces of the economy already. Uh, so, you know, everyone's scared about like the M. This is the, 20 people or whatever who are the best hardest workers in the world that get replicated a billion times and do all the wage labor what happens to everybody else well hopefully everybody else has some money in stock because suddenly all your stock is going to go up by 20 billion percent every few days and uh so one of the you know one of the things i did was like i put some money into bitcoin just because it uh, it looks like um maybe bitcoin will be used in the future economy i don't know i just bought a little bit and left it there forever and I haven't touched it. I bought a little Ethereum too, just because it was the next one out of Bitcoin. And apparently you can use it for smart contracts or whatever. I don't know. Uh, but I haven't touched any other coins. They all seem like scams. And then, you know, I put a bunch of money in the stock market. Not a huge amount. An order of magnitude more than I have uh, in, in Bitcoin. And then uh, very diversified, right? Although only diversified in the US market, come to think of it. Maybe I should buy some worldwide stocks in case China does end up taking over everything. Uh, and then put some money into real estate, which I think is the least likely to be valuable in the future, because hopefully at some point we'll fix these stupid fucking laws that don't let us build housing <laughs> and implement a Georgia's land tax, in which case my real estate investments will kind of grind down to shit. But, uh, and especially if there's some sort of massive worldwide revolution, then my places get burned down. But, uh, importantly, they are very stable right now. It's, it's weird that I consider real estate my short-term investment, <laughs> but I do, and uh, it's, it's working. So I think setting yourself up to own chunks of the world uh, would be one good hedge for, you know, assuming we don't all die, you have some stake in what's coming in the future. It's kind of like that, uh, that story where everybody who bought a tiny stake in the Australian superintelligence uh, eventually never has to work again. So I get the general point of what you're saying when you say when H- when Hansen says the economy is going to double or could double twice a week or whatever mm-hmm. what is the economy like define it and give two examples <laughs> uh so the i believe in the way that it's used is the sum total of everything that we make that's useful interesting because like I, I guess i can see that happening this is pre transhuman stuff this is just workforce like imagine today but with like a billion robots helping do stuff uh, I mean, I, specifically who he's talking about after uploads become a thing. Yeah. But then I'm just thinking, like, most of what we need then, you know, won't be a concern. Right. Especially if, like, uploading is a thing that you can do optionally for, like, very little money. Mm-hmm. Uh, we talked about the movie Downsizing last mm-hmm. week on uh, Not Everything is a Clue. I watched a trailer for it. It looks awesome. Nice. Yeah. I've got... It's, like, I think three bucks on Amazon. I need to put it on my list and watch it. Sure. Um, the... Uh, you know, so I imagine agreeing to uh I could I can at least imagine a future where agreeing to to be uploaded would be a cheap thing because suddenly the government doesn't have to support you with UBI, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I was like, Hey, if you want to just like take a one time payment and we can do whatever you want with it and we'll put you in this machine forever where you get to be fucking God, um, doesn't that sound fun? Yeah. Uh I guess what I'm saying is that it's not clear to me what 
the economy will be worth at that point anyway if you can just jump out into the matrix um well the it's yeah it's for the people who own small chunks of the economy don't have to jump into the matrix because they got a little yeah they can stay here in meat space where like their back hurts and shit and well, hopefully by you know, then you can replace sleep your back and eat and all that stuff or your entire body yeah yeah i, I guess i i don't know i it's gonna be fucking wild first it, thing i'm gonna do as soon as the technology is affordable is regrow a new body for me transplant my brain into it that sounds nice yeah i'm distracted thinking about what body i'm designing all right so i guess i guess i bring that up because like i feel like the age of m scenario in particular is so specific that i don't actually burn a lot of fuel worrying about that particular outcome like it all sounds plausible as hell but it it has a lot of in fact i think that's that's one of the things he said when he was talking about the book was like you know, he's not saying that this is going to happen. He's saying that if these couple of things, here's what that would look like. Yeah. And to me, that just sounds like basically science fiction, which is fun. Yeah. But, like, I, I guess... I mean, the biggest thing it presupposes is that uh, there's a continuity of government because all property is just the government saying you own this. Well, there's that too. I mean, or you saying you own this and you've got your gun saying, this yeah. is mine, stay back. Exactly, yeah. But, uh, I mean, there's that, but also just, like, the idea that uh, I don't know. I mean, like, it's not clear to me like how an M would help with like a lot of menial labor, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and not not to you know put down any any jobs or whatever, but like, I I don't see um like checkout people at grocery stores going anywhere for the foreseeable future. Eh, you, you could get a uh one of those. What is it? The the company that makes Big Dog. Oh, you mean uh those robots? Yeah. I mean, maybe, but the thing is, like, if it gets tripped up, it gets tripped up. Then they need the human to come by and straighten it out, right? Yeah, sure, like, but then you only need one human to work per grocery store. That That's a fair point. I guess that could happen. I guess what I'm thinking is, like, they've had self-checkout forever, but nobody – people use that for small checkouts, but not for big ones because it's a super fucking hassle. I would use it for big ones if I could. You can. I mean, they don't want you to. I, I often go over the limit of 15, but once you start going to – you have more stuff than they have space yeah. for, yeah, for the four bags on the side, then it's hard. I guess I, I bring all that up because, like, I, I see it's not clear about an M would help solve that problem, right? Um, so, I, I don't know, I guess... I mean, an emulated intelligence wouldn't because they're entirely virtual, but, I mean, an M can even pilot a robot, right? That's a good point. Yeah, okay. Then that does solve the problem. And then you're not, you could pay them pennies because they don't need to eat and sleep, and yeah. they don't need a house. So, okay, yeah, no, all right. I got too distracted down that rabbit hole. <laughs> we're, I think I want, I want to circle back to, uh, like, because we're talking AI risk, right? We are. And so it is worth wondering what kind of emergency this is. Is this a, the population is, 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 I'm also not even sure that's a problem. I meant to mention that as long as I'm rambling. Oh, the population decreasing? Yeah. Like, I could, I could easily imagine a future where, like, AGI never happens. And so the population, you know, the graph from 1940, you know, where it skyrocketed from like three to seven billion in 60 years, mm -hmm. it, it wiggles a little bit for the next three centuries. Mm -hmm. Like, so what? It, you know, like, I don't see that being the end of the world. I mean, it depends. You need a certain amount of humans to keep the society running at the level that it's running at. Because, but, you know, the more technology we get, the less humans we necessarily need because we can automate more and more of it. So I don't, I don't know how much it matters. Um, it's more just I like start, and it's not a great trend if like, oh, look, it's going to start going down. But like, I'm not convinced that like, it'll go down to zero, right? Well, a part of the problem is uh, old people are generally supported by young people, and that puts more and more stress on young people. But again, uh, if young people are much more productive, they can support a lot more old people. There might be there might be more resentment among younger people that they're being taxed so much to support the olds. Uh, I hope they have the the long the the foresight to realize that they'll be old for most of their life and that they can look forward to collecting that you know when it's their turn unless they want to work forever i mean maybe maybe they are crushed enough by the debt that they uh they'd rather say fuck it let's burn down the system and start over without the old people oh yeah i mean find a balance between you know getting people to want to burn the system down and them not doing enough but yeah and yeah. also you know, a lot of people don't have children because it's so fucking expensive to have children. So they're like, I don't know if there's going to be new youngs when I'm old to take care of me. That is an interesting one. And a lot of people don't have kids for other reasons, too. In fact, that's one of the things that comes up in this post. Mm -hmm. Is like, well, I'm not going to have kids. The world's going to end. Mm -hmm. And I 
do see that as a bad reason not to have kids. Um, like, I, I've at least heard tell of one person who didn't want to have kids because of climate change. Yeah. And I don't know that their sacrifice, if they really wanted to have them otherwise, is actually worth the cost, right? Mm -hmm. Like, sure, humans are bad for the environment on net, right? Mm -hmm. But you can offset your your impact with fairly small donations. Um, and I'm, I honestly, I don't know if humans on net are bad for the environment. I think humans on net are good for the environment because the average human helps um, society, builds the economy, advances technology. And uh, we, I mean, we are amazingly less polluting per person now than we were 30 years ago. But and it's because humans keep working on this shit. Yeah, I think one could argue, though, that your your net impact on the environment will be positive, whereas if you weren't born, you wouldn't have an impact on the environment. Yeah, like, so... That... Or when I say positive, I mean, like, it'll be uh, ha positive integers, not positive impact. Oh, see, like, I think the average human has net positive impact on the environment in, in terms of making things better instead of worse. I mean, if you're still turning on your lights yeah. and driving your car, you're yeah. putting out... You but know, I'm whatever. also helping to support a society that uh, is making all these things more effective, is finding out how to pull carbon out of the atmosphere, is switching to, to newer, better technologies, which we couldn't if we had less people and we're still stuck in older technologies. Great point. Yeah. And, you know, so that's the kind of thing where, like, if if this person who didn't want to have kids because of climate change had, had considered that, they might have been like, oh, this is a bad reason not to have kids. Hmm. So, I mean, I guess... That's that's different than the point from the post, which is like, you know, don't not live your life because you think things are going to be different, right? Yeah. Um, there was a in the comments. Did you read the comments for this post, by the way? No, I didn't. I, I read a few of them because she she goes over a uh, like actually a whole other chunk of the essay that didn't make it into the original post. Oh, memetics sometimes leads to amplification of false emergencies. Oh, I should have read the um, comments. Yeah, but what was funny was that uh, there was a re response here by uh, Rob Bessinger. Well, I guess I, I won't read the whole thing because then it's another back and forth with Anna. But then he basically says, like, uh, you this ups, this updates me towards your view on kid having. Hmm. Uh, it wasn't the focus of his previous comment, but that was something he was less convinced of before. He says, I feel bad about that having happened and curious about whether I or other people I know are making a similar mistake. I won't spoil the ending by telling you what persuasive case she made there. Okay. Um, but Do you it, mind spoiling the ending and telling me the case she made? Uh. I would, except for I. It's a very long comment. Okay. okay. And uh, I don't know how I can succinctly summarize it. Um, be careful about planning your paths towards your deepest animal goals that your animal doesn't buy. Um, mm. And note that it can be robustly. Or note that it can be hard to robustly know what your animal is or isn't buying. Um, I think that, and they they talk about the idea of like magisterium for like the distant future versus like what I'm doing now mm -hmm. and people, some people view those as two very distinct things and some people view them as like the same. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, I think that part of the point here was, uh, um, Rob being moved over from one position to the other. That said, I more skimmed some of the lower comments because they're, the comments are longer than the original post. Yeah. Um, they always are. I know, but I, even just these first five. Oh, oh okay. so yeah, it, it gets along real fast. Um, I'm like one of the, one of the great things about meeting Charlie was that she taught me to to think of my body as an animal that I am taking care of, and that's really helped my my feeling of how how I should be doing things. Like this this animal greatly impacts me because I have to live inside of it, but I got to be nice to it and I got to take care of it, uh, or otherwise it's going to be having a very bad time, and that's going to make me have a bad time too. I like that framing a lot. And yeah, I mean, if you resent it because it's not doing what you'd like it to do, well, it's going to resent you right back yeah. uh, in the way that you're anthropomorph in, in the anthropomorphic way that you're imagining. I think that I kind of always viewed my my body as somebody I have a high obligation to take care of because their well being, its well being in the future will be directly proportional to mine, right? Yeah. So like, I didn't take up smoking, for example, even though I'm told it's great, um, or at least it has its upsides. Uh, there's a reason people do it, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, oh, I didn't get into that because I was like, you know, I've seen where that actually, I've seen where that train, that train ends and it's not in a destination I want to be at. So most of my life, I resented my body, didn't like being stuck in this bullshit meat suit. And then, you know, for a while I enjoyed it. It was kind of nice feeling embodied for a number of years. Like I was part of my body, but it, 
it just it didn't last that doesn't work very well with with me and my mental architecture so this new framing is a very nice compromise between the two i like it yeah i'll have to put that in the back burner and see how my brain likes it so we have a friend who is very very much on board with singularities coming in 2029 mm-hmm. is his estimate uh and he also has a number of kids and doesn't doesn't have any like issues with it doesn't think like that's a bad thing or anything i think having kids is its own intrinsically fulfilling thing i don't know i i don't know why i brought that up just because you were saying that people were thinking about not having kids because the end of the world is coming and i'm like i don't know if that should make any difference or not i mean so if you thought the you know i like my phrase at the end of the world just because it lands with the book i just read but um like if if your idea of whatever a singularity future coming in the not too distant future like that should make you actually maybe more excited to have kids yeah because like you know unless you think it's going to happen in the six months then all your kid having will be diaper changing and not sleeping right but like you get basically all the fun parts Mm -hmm. you know watching the kid learn to read ride a bike and you know whatever all all the stuff i'm told is super enjoyable um and then you've made one more person who gets to enjoy the future yeah so you might still get to that post singularity though Oh, yeah, totally. I'm just saying that it doesn't seem like a good reason not to have one now. Yeah. Um, well, because I think that the world will be better and, you know, radically changed for the better in 25 years. So I'm not going to bother. It's like, why wouldn't you bother? Mm-hmm. Like, there's the Anna, – Anna's post here ends with a an argument that I think is, like, surprise that has to be made. But I guess she she works in this, you know, the circle of people and I don't. But she sees burnout in people who, who work in AI safety and EA mm-hmm. and – I, I get I get EA burnout because I've I've read about it, mm-hmm. um, but I've never n- been that invested myself like to the level of like burnout or known anyone who was. So yeah. maybe this was a problem back earlier in the day when people realized that you know I can go 100 miles an hour for a, two years on this, or I can go 30 miles an hour for the you know the next 50. Mm-hmm. It may, I can go a lot further if I go slower, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that's a solved problem. But the idea that She's seen people burn out on AI safety research or whatever. Mm-hmm. It's not even clear to me what that work looks like. That you'd burn out, like, you know, staying up late doing math and, and like... I imagine just focusing on nothing else but that. That yeah. sounds exhausting. And well, that, that's why people burn out. Well, I know, but that's, that's to me, that just sounds like such an obviously escapable failure mode of, like, why would you... Unless you think, like, Cause you only it, have... it's coming this summer. I'd better stay up late tonight. Like, well, it's a very hard problem, which is probably going to take many extremely start p- smart people very many years to figure out and if it takes you what 15 years to figure it out and the singularity comes in 14 years then the entire human race is wiped out that's uh that sucks maybe maybe work a little harder for those 14 years so that you can push the timeline back one year it also makes you wonder like what does one person could solve that will affect the course of this no, and, uh, and i also think it's um overestimating how long you can go burning the candle at both ends like that yeah because burning out after two three years is is worse than working slower for 15 years i think there's a really obvious explanation that anna doesn't hit here Mm. that surprised me because it seems like the most obvious and probably most correct explanation she says i see burnout people working hard at the expense of their long-term resources and capacities more often than i expect is optimal for helping with ai risk i'm not sure why some of it is people who in my opinion have a better shot and a better plan than most for reducing ai risk which makes it more plausible for which makes more plausibility actually helpful for those folks to be doing work at the expense of long-term capacity. Uh, her writing style does not lend itself for me to quoting very well, and I also can't read and talk. Mm. Um, point is, she sees burnout and she can't really explain it. Um, much of it might be because they're like, you know, they're uh, they feel guilty for not trying as hard as they can or whatever. Mm-hmm. I think what it is, they want to be seen trying as hard as they can, mm-hmm. right? Hey, do you want to come to this party? I can't. I'm working on AI risk to save your future. It's a really like, you know. Does she not read Robin Hanson say anything? Like, I, I can I can see Hanson explaining all of this without, you know, half a second thought, right? Yeah, but, you know, a, a lot of people think Hanson overstates the case. I think he might, but I think that this is a good example of it. Like, yeah. I've the closest I've seen to EA burnout is, like, diehard veganism. Okay. And they, because I think they have the benefit of being on the right side of moral history. Hmm. And so when they say, oh, no, I'm going to have to skip this meal... And go hungry because they don't have any, you know, animal cruelty free options here. Um, it's it more serves as a big signal to like how good of a person they are than actually helping solve 
animal suffering problems yeah. in that for that particular meal or whatever. Yeah. Especially if it's food at your house. And it's like I already bought it. Right. You know, I'm not gonna buy that much more if you have, you know, half a sandwich, right? Yeah. So uh but it but it sure makes them look good. And in their defense, they do look good. because uh, they're doing the right thing. Well, importantly, uh, if it's someone whose house you'll be back again in the future, maybe they will uh if buy different stuff for you if you come back. I mean, you can do that, ask them to do that, and still, you know, not starve that afternoon, right? Right, right, yeah. But, but maybe you didn't know that you were going to be at their place or whatever. Yeah. I guess I'm just saying, like, you know, you, I think... Also, if you if you were like, oh, I guess you don't have any other food, I'll go ahead and eat it now, then I have no motivation to to change my buying habits when you're coming over. Sure you do. To make to make me more comfortable next time I come over. Because you know I'd be uncomfortable the first time. Sure, it depends. You weren't uncomfortable enough to not eat it, so... I was how, how, to say something. Yeah, but this, this how is, dedicated are you really? This might not be the the perfect exa- analog for uh for EA and AI burnout. Um, I mean, I but, could totally see the burnout. It was it was hard living when I thought that uh, living was a moral atrocity, you know, and uh, b- which was basically a form of EA burnout before that was a thing or a word that I knew. Uh, and I, if you if you think that whenever you aren't working on saving the human race it's the equivalent of you know the moral atrocity of letting children die when you could have saved them that's extremely hard on your psychology whether you're working or you're not working because either you're working all the time and burning yourself out or you're not working and feeling like you're a monster it's weird like because i think that makes sense maybe that's just why i'm not a very good utilitarian Hmm. like i not to like pat myself on the back but like i give money to effective charities Hmm. i give some thousands of dollars a year Oh, it, wow. it is not ten percent of my income, um, you know. So it's like, but and ten percent is like I could afford to do more, probably, right? right. If I were to live more scarcely, um, mm. I could afford to do a lot more if I didn't want to buy a new house. Mm-hmm. Like, and why would I, you know? Why, why? How on earth can I price my new house with a slightly bigger? You know, all I want is like a house like with a dedicated office, right? Because mm-hmm. I work from home. Mm-hmm. Um, how can I possibly justify that over the lives that I could save with that money? Right? I just don't think about it in those terms, like. I think that I'm helping some, and that's that's good. Yeah. You know, there's always better, yeah. but don't let like the better slash perfect be the enemy of good. Um, I mean, that's that's a healthy way to think about it. Yes, but not everybody. <laughs> I mean, that that's the whole point, right? That not everybody is perfectly psychologically healthy. Well, I think that there's also I I, I appreciate the the snuck in compliment that I'm perfectly psycholo- psychologically healthy. <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I, maybe not perfectly, but, but more so in this regard than some other people. I think the case is easier with altruism than it is with AI risk hmm. because like I can say and somehow sleep at night. Maybe I'm emotional. Maybe, I, maybe I'm psychologically unhealthy because I can sleep at night knowing that I could have saved more children this year than I did. Yeah. Right. But I'm going to sleep great. You know, so I sound like a psychopath, but um, <laughs> the difference is, is that I could, I can do that. If I thought that, well, I'm gonna half-ass it, and the world might end because of it. Like that's different. The number, the number of kids that I don't, that either of us don't save with our charitable giving or something, um, that won't hasten the end of the world. Right. And so, like, if you really thought, no, if I bust my ass as hard as I can for the next ten years, there's like a two percent chance I can stop the world from ending. Then, yeah, you're gonna skip parties. You're gonna take all the stimulants you can. You're gonna do whatever. To, what if one of those kids might have become the guy who discovers how to uh, align AI successfully in seven, eight years? Well, uh, what, they're going to do it at, like, 15? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> People start doing amazing things in, in, in their teens. Uh, I don't know. I mean... Like, how old was Newton when he came... He was in college, right, when he came up with the theory of gravity? Sounds about right. Yeah. But if we're talking, you know, babies now, by the time college is here, well, that's the end of the world already. So that's, that's past the timeline horizon. Well, so. let's assume that they're six or seven. So in six or seven years, they'll be in their mid-teens. They can start contributing in some way. They, they might be able to contribute in some way. Like, I mean, I think this, this, this analogy gets strained. Like, we could just say, why am I not giving money to, like, any AI investigation Yeah, why aren't you instead? doing that, Stephen? You could be saving the world. I'm told that... The couple that I know of have all the money they need, really? and so, uh, and I'm told that by the people who run them. <laughs> so, well, why don't you like start putting out a podcast or something to get out the word about this kind of stuff? Well, we do a little bit of that. <laughs> I don't know. So, I guess what I'm getting at though is that I think that the case for EA burnout is different. I think it's more guilt driven than it is like desperation driven, right? Is there? I think there's a subtle but important difference. Okay. Whereas, like again, 
I, the the people that I'm not saving can be counted in like you know a graph of dead bodies. Right. But if if my indulgence wanting to take you know a night off a week to relax, well that's one that's uh that's one seventh of the time that I could have been spending spent actually working. So you're saying that the AI alignment burnout is actually much more understandable. I think so. Oh, okay. I thought yeah. that's the opposite of what you were saying. Oh earlier. no, sorry. Yeah, okay. must not have been clear. Which makes sense. I'm kind of rambling, but I guess. It's at least more understandable, but I don't know if I would still encourage it, right? Because if you burn out after three years, like, you're not helping for 10. Yeah. And that, you know, we could have used the 10 years worth of help. Right. That's thus the push to tell people not to burn out and to be more psychologically healthy and maybe go out and go to a party and see some kids or whatever. Touch grass, as they say. Yeah. Go touch yeah. children. <laughs> but not in the bad way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah i mean i don't know I, what, I guess i've been doing all the talking you pitched the question and i ran with it for half an hour what what can you do what if i were to ask you what what would you do what would you recommend to I mean, help solve this problem first of all always like take care of your smaller sphere that you can take care of first uh so try to prepare for the future put your money in things do whatever you think would be helpful for you when you're you know immediate circle of concern to survive all that but on a greater level i don't i don't know man uh trying to get more technologically savvy people in politics may help uh which would also mean things like vastly increasing the salary that politicians get so that you know people who are drawn to good careers that pay a lot can go into there because you kind of got to be independently wealthy to get into politics right now, uh, with some exceptions. And they make like two hundred k a year as a congressperson. I mean, that's jack shit compared to how much you would get as a good programmer after the amount of effort it takes to become a congressperson. Like, I think, you don't I, think just that, I think get elected I think that your metric that. for what a good programmer programmer gets paid is skewed by one insane person salary that we are aware of. Yeah. But that, that said, like Congress congress representative isn't like a full-time job you could program on the side you know like it's true but it kind of you can't go directly to the u.s congress right you have to start small and work your way up you're over, right it's a whole life's worth of effort yeah yeah hmm that's a tough one yeah so maybe maybe that um maybe try to sabotage the u.s so china takes over <laughs> not really because that would be a horrible life well, and it's also just not clear that it would help. Yeah. Like, again, if there was a very good case that could be made that it actually would help, then, you know, right. then someone could make that case and based on how they want to live their life on it. But For all we know, it could make things much worse. Yeah. I mean, it, it very well might. Yeah. You know, I, I imagine that if we're going to just say China is an entity that has a will, that if China got its way, they would be the ones in charge of AI research, right? Right. And it's like, no, you guys actually aren't going to do the best job at it. We need other people to do it. Right. Uh, we don't need a government to, to, to build this thing. We've uh, seen you be staggeringly incompetent on a number of other things already. Yeah. Like, we don't, we don't need a government building this. We need a government uh, facilitating the safe building of this, which is different. Um, I don't know. That's weird. But I don't know much to say, you know, to, to wrap up on that, I guess, other than, like, at the end of the day, I'm still going to go home and have fun this afternoon. Like, I'm yeah. not going to go Google most effective AI charity dollars to, to spend, right? Right. Um, and I, rec I suggest everyone do the same. You know, if, if you happen to be in that very small subset of people that have the ability to contribute to this problem, like directly with your work, mm -hmm. uh, do read, read this nine minute blog post by Anna that we'll link in the, by Anna Solomon here in the, the episode description, or if people don't know what episode descriptions are, it's just called what should you change in response to an emergency and AI risk? Yeah. Um, and hopefully she can convince you better than my ramblings that you should enjoy yourself and have fun. It's good for you. And it's good for your actual goal of saving the world. The AI policy guy on Twitter uh, did say in his thread that there aren't enough people working on AI policy. And yes, this is a call for more people to do that. So maybe, uh, I don't know, try to contact him or something or the organization he works for. If you already had an inkling disposition to want to work in government, here's an effective outlet for that impulse. So, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Well, cheers to the end of the world. Hopefully, it comes soon and and uh, happily. Yeah. Yeah.
trying to trying to think anything anything I would change about my life. The only thing I can really think of is just not losing hope and continuing to uh, to keep going, just because you know the really good ending might be nearby. I'm really glad you said that. Mm-hmm. Uh, that should have been something that we hit harder again. So nice job remembering it. Yeah, you know, like the good ending could be right around the corner, mm-hmm. and you don't want to miss it. Yeah. Um, if you're still not happy after that, which would be surprising. Then you, then you, you know, you've seen the good ending and it's not for you. Then, then you can decide then. But right. uh, wait, stick around to see it. That's solid. One more thing: Stephen and me are back now. I think it was the day after we recorded this. Scott Alexander wrote a piece on general artificial intelligence as well, and all the everybody reacting and updating recently about that. Uh, we will link the piece. Uh, he kind of said, sort of similar to what we said, things like, um, "Well, this looks like it's." A thing and it's going to be soon and i don't know what else what all we can do about it uh he did have a suggestion he pointed out that government regulations can really strangle an industry like the fda has strangled medicine here and killed millions of people uh nuclear regulation has strangled nuclear here and killed millions of people gmo regulation has uh strangled gmos in europe and killed millions of people so maybe maybe we can regulate ai get the three big AI research things in cahoots with the government, strangle that industry, slow it down real bad, prevent newcomers from coming in, and uh, save billions of people. And successfully kill millions of people. (laughs) Well, as long as we're saving billions, it's it's fine. If that actually works out, I will be uh, even more convinced that we are living in a multiverse, and this is the the branch that managed to have the crazy coincidences that just line up right for us us not to all go extinct. But I wonder... Weirdness. If AI is the kind of thing that could be curbed as easily as nuclear power or GMOs. Well, he did acknowledge that it would probably take a one world government, uh, which might be uh, even harder to do than an artificial intelligence, or at least full partnership with China, which uh, also probably harder to do than creating an artificial intelligence. So poop on that idea. I think those are both points you brought up. They, those are things I said as well, yes. Although I didn't say it was harder than, uh, that it would be harder than making artificial intelligence. And it's entirely possible that we both got that idea from similar sources. Well, I definitely didn't read SSC on it. So I'm going to go ahead and give me a, oh, you mean you and him? Yeah, yeah. I see. I don't have much to add to that, I guess. One last thing to add that uh, apparently if you want to get involved in AI policy in the U.S. government, maybe... It won't make any difference, but maybe it'll make some difference. And there is a link in the SSC post on how you can apply to uh, to work in that field. We'll link both to the SSC post and to that directly. So maybe some people who uh, are young and energetic and think that this might help can, can jump on that. I don't want to say throw all the fun in your life away to focus just on this. But Definitely not. I also don't want you to be like the reason that this doesn't work out. But you know, it almost certainly won't be. I'm not going to do anything. So yeah. I'm not losing any sleep and at night. <laughs> people who are just getting out of college uh, need jobs. And these this is jobs that they can get that might make the world better. Would you like a job? Come save the world. Exactly. Somebody's got to do it. Well, fingers crossed. All righty. Well, shall we move on to the less wrong posts? Let's do it. Okay. This week, we have three posts because one of them is really short. The first post is not one of the shorter ones, but it, it's still short-ish. My Strange Beliefs. Wherein Eliezer confesses that he has some strange beliefs. Uh, He says that no matter what I use as an example of socially weird but true, some people are going to disagree with it. Otherwise, it wouldn't be an example. And weird but true is certainly an important topic in rationality. Otherwise, there would be... Otherwise, there would be a knockdown argument against ever dissenting. Um, I guess, seeing as we just talked about the weird but true idea that the world as we know it may change within the coming decades this is rather appropriate it is it's also funny because this post is written in response to like an angry commenter that i feel like i mean maybe this i mean this is obviously a point he wanted to make anyway but like don't indulge people who come to your website and be like you shouldn't talk about this and it's like you shouldn't come to my house and listen to what i'm saying yeah that's i guess always my attitude about ones presenting themselves online and it's like someone comes along to your twitter handle and it's like i don't like this picture and it's like, then don't follow me on Twitter. I'm not, I'm don't not, look at it. I'm bitch. not. I'm not on Twitter. But my understanding is, you have to go to someone's thing to see what they're posting, right? No, not necessarily. The algorithm will randomly put things in your Twitter feed. Not randomly. Oh no, based it'll, it'll, on what other people that you follow like or who they follow, yeah. and based on what they think will keep you on screen longer, which might actually be outrage porn. Yes, okay. absolutely. So 
Twitter, like they'll even pull in things that are trending that nobody you know has uh, interacted with at all. But they're like, I think this person would be engaged by seeing this tweet. So they'll put it in your feed. So in that case, your motivation is don't feed the beast. Mm-hmm. And just if you if something's put before you that you don't want to see, well, that's that's Twitter too. This is a blog. Yeah. You have you have to knock at this door to be let in, you know. Dude, Twitter. Um, I've been I've been you know using it a bit in the in the previous months, and every now and then I see someone ask something like, uh, "What what's the I don't know what's the most underrated sci-fi movie or something, right?" And for a second, I want to click on it and reply, and then I'm like, "There's dozens of replies already, hundreds really soon." My Opinion literally doesn't matter. The person isn't going to read it. If I were to ask that question and I had tens of thousands of followers, I wouldn't read any of the answers either. I, I don't have that kind of time. I don't have that kind of attention. I don't care. It's just a way to drive engagement. And I'm like, this is stupid. I'm not engaging with you. Smart. Yeah. I, I mean, and that's not even like outrage, you know, uh, attracting. This is just, in fact, it's appealing to you on a whole other level. Sci-fi stuff. Boy, do I have opinions. And that's it's right. Like, Hold on a second. I see what you're doing here, robots. Yeah. You don't actually care. Yeah. Yeah, I, I like this because we, we do discuss a lot of socially weird things. And I don't know, like, how would your, what do you think your parents' reaction would be if they heard this episode where we just talked about the world ending? I have no idea. Huh. Um, I, I don't think they, I think because my, my take was so blasé that they, you know, if I was sitting here saying, you know, look, hunker down, you know, buy a gun, uh, mm-hmm. stockpile food and ammo. Like, Although everyone should buy a gun. And stockpile food and ammo. <laughs> That's um, true, actually. Yes, but uh, always make sure you have at least one week's worth of calories in your basement. I I, I don't know. I think that they wouldn't be all that s- surprised, you know. And I'm finding that my beliefs aren't that strange, even to like people that aren't in my like aren't in our immediate circle of of nerds. Like, yeah. as a dinner at a, at uh, my wife's friend's house a couple weeks ago, and I don't know how it came up, but somehow post whatever, like, what do you plan to do with your body after you die? Came up. Mm-hmm. And I explained what I plan to do with my body, mm-hmm. and they thought it was interesting. Oh, cool! And they were they were polite and, and engaged, and you know, asking follow up questions. No. And so you know, it wasn't like, well, that's weird, you weirdo. Mm-hmm. Um, so I don't know. I guess I would count on on. Do I have any weird beliefs that you think that like most people would be like, that's fucking weird? Because I to my in my head, I don't have a bucket labeled strange beliefs. Uh, yes, you believe that the world may end, uh, the world as we know it may end soon. Uh, you, but I don't act like I believe that. That's the thing, right? right? So like, I on paper I believe that, but I'm saying go forth and go to the movies and you know, yeah. um, you <laughs> plan to be frozen after you die because you might get resurrected in the future. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, this even though I think this is un uncontroversially true uh there are a lot of people who simply don't believe a non-human thing could ever have human intelligence like a a machine or something like no there's no way it'll always just be a machine and uh so that is technically a a weird belief and i guess even endorsing veganism even if i'm not walking the walk is a weird belief to say they're actually right you guys are wrong i'm wrong yeah right yeah um i am being forced to take more steps in the right direction though oh yeah with the lactose intolerance Oh, yeah. yeah, that sucks. I mean, no, it's, it's actually good. I've been wanting an excuse to do this for years. I tried switching to milk alternatives a few years ago, and they all sucked. I think they're better now than they used to be. Oat milk wasn't a thing 10 years ago, really. Yeah, I don't think. oat milk is amazing. And so, like... You know there's a virus, I think it's a virus, you can get that'll make you allergic to meat? Uh, that's interesting. I don't know if I want to go that far. Okay. You know, uh, but, you know, we'll see. I need to work out, like, an actual healthy diet first, but... Um. Anyway, like like dairy is just a nightmare factory. You know, like it is possible to raise and kill humane meat, mm-hmm. but like in order to get milk from a cow, you have to take away its baby. Like it has to have re- it has to be lactating. Yeah, and it can't be wasting food feeding the baby. Right. And so, like the baby misses its mom, and the mom wants its baby. They're both super sad. So you could have milk with your cereal. Yeah. yeah. And you know, you could take a slight util hit by having oat milk instead, and it's actually comparable. Mm-hmm. So, uh, anyway. Mm. And I, I say that as somebody who just got on this bandwagon, like, in the last few weeks. So, uh, cool. but I, I, I don't know why I brought all that up. Oh, weird beliefs. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think, you know, polyamory is probably a weird belief. But it's, yeah, like, it's yeah. also, it's a, it's a belief slash lifestyle. Yeah. Like, I believe in polyamory. <laughs> right, 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 right. It's just, it's not my cup of tea. Yeah. I don't know anyone who, I mean, I guess there are people who will be like, you shouldn't do that with your genitals in your bedroom. But, like, those people are always safe to ignore, right? <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I don't think anyone should. I don't think anyone can be against it. Maybe they think it's bad for the children, right? And well, so, they can think it's bad for society in general. Yeah, 
I guess, but it's not clear what that could mean. Uh, they they have arguments. They 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 always have arguments, but they they have anything worth listening to? I'm not sure. I mean, you obviously don't. Maybe worth listening to. Do you think there's a steel man case against it? No, this is a bit far afield, but um, like it makes people emotionally unhappy, and that reflects badly. Like that reflects into society. I kids need a nuclear family. I could make a steel man against it. Yes. Uh, again, I don't buy it because I am polyamorous, but uh, I could see. I could see a non-terrible case made for it, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Which which would take like a lot more time. Should I? Do you no, want me to try right now? I mean, not not if you feel like you couldn't do it justice. We can save it, or you can if you're. I mean, whatever you feel like doing. Um, that it's one of those things that people think will make them happier, but actually doesn't. Much like I don't know, using drugs or eating sugary, fatty foods. Uh, and it it, it leads to. Um, mental health issues, uh, depression, loss of meaning, and society as a whole suffers as well as the individual. Some individuals might flourish, but it still has greater knock-on effects on society with a loss of trust and a loss of uh, energies, which are redirected into getting laid rather than into doing more productive stuff. Uh, I mean, the, I'm just shotgunning things right here, but these are all things that I have heard argued and that could reasonably be reasonably be argued somewhat like mental health conditions are much greater uh or seem to be not much greater but noticeably greater among liberal people uh, rather than conservative people and is that causal one way or the other or just a correlation i don't know but you could maybe they just talk about it, it more or maybe they talk about it more but you could conceivably make a case for it uh that that this is this is a trap that humans fall into where they think it's something that they want but it turns out that uh, they are, in fact, not happy this way, and most of them will eventually turn into some flavor of, you know, disaffected nihilist who mm-hmm. seeks pleasure but is unfulfilled in life. I can see that case being made, but not convincingly. Right, right. right. Yeah. Okay, that was fun. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, we got strange beliefs. What's funny, though, is, like I said, just the format of this post is him responding to somebody who disagreed with them online. And I guess then he's taking this opportunity to talk back to everybody who's done that. Yeah. And everybody who will. Yeah. yeah. The next time someone gives him shit, he can just link to this. and Or someone else can do it in the comments. Yeah. Just because I called this blog overcoming bias doesn't mean that anytime any of the authors that the... Anytime any author says something you disagree with, you should comment, OMG, how biased. I'm so disappointed in you. I thought you'd do better. <laughs> Part of the art of rationality is having extended discussions with people you disagree with. OMG, you are biased. Does not present much basis for continuing discussion. Yeah. I, I love that he points out that part of rationality is having extended discussions with people. And also, I don't know, did did you get this a lot when you talked with people outside of the rational sphere about rationalism? And they were like, well, that's not rational. And I'm like, dude, rationalism doesn't say, you know, this or that is the correct answer. It's a toolbox for how to think about things. So you can't just say that a certain position is not rational. You could say that it wasn't Maybe you could say it wasn't arrived at using these tools correctly or something, and then we could discuss that. But, like, I don't know. Believing in cryonics isn't rational. That's, that's the example I was going to bring up, because I've, I've met that from people inside and outside the community. Mm-hmm. And I think I've met more of, like, the you're wrong, your, your framework is wrong with, like, the skeptic movement more than I did with the rationalist movement. But mm-hmm. I think it's more involved in online arguments back then, too. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, cryonics, for someone to say that's not rational, they need to explain the case of, like, okay, well, what would make it rational then? Mm. Like... And some of it does kind of come out like the math of like buying a lottery ticket, right? right? But it's a lottery ticket that is fairly cheap in the grand scheme of things and has a giant payoff, which also is a dollar lottery ticket. But the odds, I think, are better. Mm. Uh, it's not it's not one in 300 million. It's one in 10, maybe, you know, okay. generously. Right. I'm not an ex- – like the point is that that number doesn't actually matter. It could be one in a 1,000 mm-hmm. or it could be nine in 10. Mm-hmm. And I'm still on board, yeah. right? It, it, I was about to say, there's there's a level where I wouldn't be on board, but at the level that I'm estimating it, I am on board. Right. Like, when I was, I was explaining this to my uh, to my my psychiatrist, actually, or psychologist, when uh, my shrink, mm-hmm. um, when we first got connected last year, and, uh, you know, because I was like, all right, hey, I got some, like, death-related stuff I want to talk about. That's why I'm here at therapy. Here's my thoughts on death already, so you know where I'm coming from. And, you know, mm-hmm. that did take some getting you know, crossing that, that inferential distance. And part of it was like, you know, 
Yes, it might seem far-fetched because I haven't gone into like a long list of it, and I'm not a scientist. I can't explain to you why I think this stuff is, is likely other than people say it is. But it's less unlikely than if I were to say, hey, look, I if I speak these Latin words, I can put your soul into this gem, and then right. in a thousand years it'll come out, and you can do whatever you want. Like, I can't prove to you that, you know, you can't prove to me that won't work. <laughs> But you can be so sure that you'd never give me a dollar for that, right? Yeah. yeah. And so that that's kind of like the difference of what I'm saying. Is like this is a lot more likely than like the phylactery, you know, soul embodiment thing. Yeah. And uh, that's that's there fine. are laws of physics that, as we know them, prevent the phylactery from working, but there aren't any that prevent the brain freezing from working. That's that's the way that I'm like, yeah, this doesn't violate any known, known laws of physics. Yeah. Um. But yeah, I uh, I like this one. It was it was funny. Um. Ooh. And it kind of a good shut up to everybody. I, I liked the thing he said near the end. If you think that rationality means people will agree with you <laughs> on their first try, so that anyone who doesn't do this can be dismissed out of hand as a poser, you have exa- an, a, you have an exaggerated idea of how obvious your beliefs are. That was and, the first time I've seen poser spelled. I didn't know there's a U in it. And uh, maybe that's the English spelling of poser. <laughs> uh, and the rest of it is the Brit- is the American spelling of a sentence. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, again, hammering that point that rationality is tools for how to figure something out which you know if you're involving other people in it will probably involve discussion uh rather than just here is the rational formula now you must believe me well and also you know if you think rationality means that people won't disagree with you um like then you're objectively wrong well you're objectively wrong but also it's like how what would that even look like you know we say we're rational and we all agree on everything Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and presumably, if you're sitting on rationality, you're not one. You're not one of people who thinks you've drank the drank the Kool Aid, and so you're not inclined to agree with them anyway. I, it just seems like a weird point for someone to make. Like, why aren't you guys all agreeing on stuff? And or why don't you agree with me on everything? It's like, well, because we disagree on stuff. Yeah. You know, yeah. we have we have factually different uh, pieces of evidence or different priors or whatever, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's all, all I right. had for that one. Next post is the really short one, posting on politics. Uh, the one thing I pulled out of this is, this is his disclaimer saying, hey, yeah, I don't like to talk about politics much, but I'm going to talk about politics for three posts. Just, you know, bear with me and then we'll get back to other stuff. And the main thing I pulled out of it was he says, if I say something that you disagree with, remember that my attempts at rationality are not sourced from a divine scripture and hence are not a package deal. Meaning you can disagree with him about anything or everything. It doesn't mean that you're not rational or that his rationality is wrong or he's not rational. It just means, you know, you disagree about something. He might be wrong about something. Uh, You can still use rationality for things. Yeah. I want to see... Well, I mean, I guess it must have been around from like 2007. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, When he says uh, this isn't part of a package deal, he links to a Wikipedia page on the package deal fallacy. Oh, okay, cool. And I don't think I'd heard that before. Like, I'm, I'm aware of it, and it makes sense. Like, yeah. you know, we, we've talked about this in roundabout ways with, like, it seems weird that if someone tells me their stance on legalization of mushrooms, I can guess their stance on drugs and immigration and... Global warming. Global warming, right? Mm-hmm. And Gun whether or not policy. they've been vaccinated. Yeah. Like, You're uh, right, yeah. And so, like, those things should not be part of a package deal, right? Mm-hmm. And for, for a lot of people who might say, like, they're moderates or centrists or free thinkers, they're not, yeah. right? Uh, you know... But with the we, majority we, of the population. But we, we have a fun kind of epicycle of people that we know that like are super pro-drug and pro-private gun ownership and concealed carry. And it's like those are two things that do not go in the same package. And mm-hmm. I like that. Mm-hmm. Um, anyway, package deal fallacy. That's cool. All right. Two-party right. swindle. Yes. Uh, he starts out talking about the robber's cave experiment uh, where he says, how do you start, start an intergroup conflict? Well, the first step was to divide 22 boys into two groups of 11. And that was quite sufficient. And I just wanted to pull it out because that was one of those things that I believe failed to replicate or I'm I'm, like, you couldn't replicate it nowadays because it would be too um, immoral to ever do such a thing to humans. Plan too hard. (laughs) And I think, I think it wasn't just replication, not to cut you off. Sorry. No, no, go ahead. It it was like not that good of science practice. Exactly. And that's, and like you're generalizing to all of humanity from, 22 upper middle class white kids from like ohio or whatever yeah. like it's like you're... even even from the beginning it wasn't that great but also they they didn't even they cheated <laughs> they actively tried to uh instigate conflict uh they 
pinned things on the other team that they didn't actually do right. uh, at the beginning. And also, they had to try this twice. The first group of 22 boys that they got together uh, didn't start fighting <laughs> despite all their best efforts. So they scrapped that one and started over. So, you know, I, I dislike the Robber's Cave experiment, even though I think mostly what what it points to that you can get two groups of people fighting rather easily is true, but you have to do more than just divide them into two groups sometimes. Well, yeah, I think it's the kind of thing that's hard to do experimentally, but like comes from the department of psychology, like from that drawer in the psychology department that is labeled like things everyone already knows to be true. Yeah. Right. It's like, oh, look, people fight if you separate them into groups and point them at the other group. Yeah. And it's like, yes, we, we, as 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 a data for this, I point you to all of human history. Yeah. Like that. So, you know, you don't really need to show this in an experiment. You know, like, and I get why this was done. This was, you know, in that same. I read a really. This is like one of the few bits of like, uh, research in psychology that I did like independently for fun when I was getting my degree. Mm -hmm. uh, I bought. I read a book that was like, fun. Like the psychology psychology experiments of the nineteen or the nineteen hundreds, mm -hmm. and. It was all like the cool, crazy shit people did. A lot of them were covered in less wrong posts. Yeah. And then I read another one where a woman tried to recreate as many as she could. Mm -hmm. uh, like a psychologist went to... Well, I could, I could go into details, but it'd take too long. But some of the famous ones like that one could try to replicate on their own, mm -hmm. um, she went and did and got mixed results. But some of them were kind of startling. Okay. Um, but anyway... Uh, Do you remember one of the startling ones? Yeah. There was like that one where I think someone was trying to prove that psychology or what do you call them psychiatric hospitals were like way too prone to diagnose people as crazy mm. and so they sent some people oh. that would say i'm hearing the word thunk in my head mm -hmm. and that's their only symptom otherwise mm. they're fine they talk about how they go to work and whatever and they were i think like 11 out of 12 of them were given a diagnosis of bipolar disorder or schizophrenia or something and the 12th one got the other diagnosis okay like they were all diagnosed with something okay and then as a aside for that one, apparently some other psychiatric hospital was like, this is bullshit. There's no way you ever did this. So I'll send some Confederates your way and uh, let me know if you spot them. Mm -hmm. And that hospital apparently turned away some number of people in the following year. Mm -hmm. The guy actually sent no Confederates. Um, <laughs> and so uh, anyway, so this woman went in, repeated the thing about Thunk and got some more skepticism than like, I think the, the original story relays, mm -hmm. but was still given a diagnosis and a prescription. Um, which, like, you know, maybe the thought is, like, you walked into a psychiatrist, like, even if, like, I'm the psychiatrist, I think you're full of shit. Like, you walked in here make, making up weird stuff. Like, there must be something wrong, right? Okay. Let me give, maybe that was what they were aiming for. But yeah. the fact that they just gave her medication and sent her on her way is kind of surprising. That I, was, wish, I wish more places would just give you medication if you asked. Well, that's the thing. She didn't ask for medication. Okay. She didn't ask for help. Okay, I see. And yeah. so, you know, like... That's the easiest way to help. I don't know what you're go what you're supposed to do if someone lies to you about their symptoms, though. Like, if I go into the doctor and I'm like, "Yeah, my my left arm is going numb. I kind of feel this pressure on my chest, and it's hard to breathe." And I give him all the symptoms of a heart attack. Like, I would expect him to give me some of the blood thinner or whatever they give you. And it's not his fault that I was lying to him, right? No, but if you gave him such a weird presentation of it, okay, you know, it's like, yeah, every day from three to three thirty, my left the fingers on my left hand tingle mm -hmm, mm -hmm. without fail. Three to three thirty, then it stops. Yeah. Like that'd be so weird. I wouldn't think heart attack. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So it that was just a that got me a bit aside there. Sorry. So we're talking about robbers cave. Oh this, yeah. This is you know a great reason swindle. to do that experiment because you get to go fucking camping for two weeks and play pranks on kids. <laughs> what other reason do you need? That's that's really like why they got like school funding to do this. Was like they thought it'd be funny like to throw eggs at kids when they weren't looking. <laughs> yeah. No, it was them. It was the other kids. <laughs> We all saw you do it. <laughs> Fuck. Start from scratch. These kids are going home. <laughs> Get those some dumber kids. Uh, but to, to your point, you can just look at all of history because uh, Eliezer also quotes the uh, Romans during the, well, for all of Roman history, basically, the populace was divided into the warring blue and green factions. Uh, there was violence in the streets. Brother would turn on brother, etc. Uh, the support of a faction became necessary eventually for any candidate for civil or ecclesiastical honors. Uh, who were these blues and greens? They were sports fans, the partisans of the blue and green chariot racing teams. Uh, so, you know, that makes sense. Just watch like the fights among, you know, at the, at the, at the sports bar after the Super Bowl, right? Yeah. Like some of that I think is just done in, you know, like full, like not fully self aware because then it can't be like indulgent fun, but partially self aware. Like I know you're not really manly, but we're going to have this, we're going to have fun fighting over this, right? I think some of this is just 
young men wanting to go out and get in a fight. And they're like, let's fight. And someone else is like, yeah, let's fight. And then they fight. <laughs> Why? Uh, you're on a different team. Good enough for me. Yeah. Sometimes all you just need is a thumbs up. I don't know if you ever did that when you were in, you know, a hormonal teenager. Hmm. Just you and your friends would just fight because you know you guys needed to vent somehow. No. Uh, before I was a teenager, like as 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 seven, eight, like once or twice we put on some uh, boxing gloves that we found in uh, this kid's dad's basement and we kind of duked it out for a little bit. But not not once I got into my teenageness. No. I think once the hormones are raging, that's like we, we would basically like you know. Anything goes, don't go for the drunk or the face. Okay. And so, like, your your goal isn't to, like, mar the other person, but it's just to, just to, just to vent. Okay. It was, it was, I think, probably a good outlet for it. I may have made, I, maybe I would have been more psychologically healthy in my youth if I had done that during my teen years. It's hard to say. Because, you know, that, that, it finds expression in other ways. Maybe I'm worse off. It's, you know, who knows? Uh, you certainly seem mentally healthier than I am. I think it, it's really easy to look like that from the outside. Or okay. With the outward presentation. But. Yeah, yeah. Right. Hey, which one of us is the one that's going to a professional therapist, right? Me? Right. Yeah. So that must mean that you're less healthy because I don't have to go to a professional therapist? Could be, yeah. Yeah, yeah, there we go. I think you're right. That's what I'm going with. Uh, but yeah, he brings it back to what we were just saying. Professional football players from favorite team have a lot more in common with the professional fa- football players from rival team than either has in common with a truck driver screaming cheers at the top of his lungs. Which, yeah, I mean, you basically always see the athletes going out and hanging out with each other, Right. Or did they try to keep that under wraps? Like, we all know that they know each other and sometimes they hang out at parties, right? Athletes? Yeah. From opposite teams, you mean? Yeah. I mean, I assume so. Right. I, I've... I Like, they even change teams sometimes. Yeah. They, and so, what a weird thing to, like, be... This This is just, like, one of the fun quirks of, of being into sports, of, like, feeling betrayed when, like, somebody wants to take a $10 million pay increase to go work for somebody else. Yeah. How could you go play for them? And it's like... Do you see how many zeros are on this check? <laughs> right. I'm just going to be playing with some other friends that I don't know as well as these friends, but whatever. The I've, hardest part is probably moving to a different state. But I feel like the zeros would make that so much, you know, take take a lot of the pin, the pain out of that. Yeah. But I think uh, I, I've never followed, like, athletes in their real lives, but I suspect that they have to be aware that we play a game and we don't actually hate the other people, right? I would assume so, yes. Yeah. yeah. Maybe there's the occasional asshole that they don't like or whatever, but yeah. most of what I know from sports comes from sports, TV shows, and movies. Okay. And in, you know, like in Ted Lasso, they don't really hate the other players, mm-hmm. you know? They hate Except the one. For fucking Jamie Tart. Yeah. <laughs> they, ha- they hate the one guy. Yeah. But because he's personally an asshole, not yes, because he plays exactly. soccer against them, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they they definitely have a lot more in common with them than than with each other than the, their fans. Uh, group identification is pretty much the service provided by football players, and since that service can be provided to many people simultaneously, salaries are naturally competitive. I like that fact. I've thought about that myself a few times. That uh, maybe I first picked it up from here. That um, that is their goal. They give they give tribal affiliations to people in a vast nation, and that's. I guess the thing that a lot of people still need. Heck, I'm sure we still need it. We have the tribal affiliation of rationalists, right? Yeah. So I try to. I was this actually came up with the same dinner conversation uh, where we talked about chronics and stuff. But my own personal identity is pretty small with stuff. Like some people put like all these things on like, oh, it was you and I talking about this? Maybe use this this framing where it was like, you know, if you had like a picture of yourself in your head, like what would you put in the picture, and then what would you put like on the whatever label underneath it? Mm-hmm. And some people have like a lot of tags. They'd put like, you know, vegan, liberal, gun owner, whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know what I'd put there. Yeah. And like, so nothing to me is like, or like their sexual identity, right? That's like another big part of people's identity. I don't know what I'd put on mine. Yeah. I feel like I should have something, but when I look in, there's nothing there. So I'm I'd, sure there's some things, but, but maybe that's good. Cause yeah. I, then, then that way I don't feel like I need to get in a turf war with everybody over, you know, I wouldn't put Packers fans. So I'd hate all the Broncos fans. Right. Right. Um, yeah. If, if, I, if, I, if there's nothing I care about, then there's nothing I care enough to fight about. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's a solid advice right there. Fair enough. It sounds very much like Finn advice. It's Can't like, get hurt if there's nothing you care about. Homer Simpson trying is the first step towards failure. <laughs> <laughs> was that a Homer quote? Uh, it was at least said on The Simpsons. I, maybe he didn't coin it, but okay. yeah. Cool. Um. Oh, so anyways, getting back to the two-party swindle. Is there a political divide... A divide of policies and interests between professional politicians on the one hand and voters on the other. Actually, I want to. I want to actually think about that. Like, do the do the politicians themselves have different interests than us? Yeah, yeah. 
I think that they they want like they need to be appealing to more people than we do, right? Sure, but I mean more in the like. Does AOC have more in common with Ted Cruz than she does with the typical AOC voter? They're both extremes, right? Uh huh. Maybe maybe the analogy would be like easier with two more middle of the road people. Mm, I like the extremes one. I'd like to think about do they actually have more in common with each other than the average voter for either one of them? Because I think maybe they do. They're both wealthy, upper class, have a ton of power. They have to play a popularity game for. The people that are cheering at, for them at home, and they and they're both kind of constrained by the fact that like, if public opinion swayed, they would sway with it to stay with the public rather than stick to whatever their convictions were, which is often a good thing. You know, progress moves, but like, if it moved in a way you didn't like, you're like, well, I still need the votes. Yeah, and that that's a game that they have to play that we don't. They both got to work in the same building. That's a huge one. If someone bombs that building, they are both affected. Uh, they're both in the public eye. Often come up in. In the news. Yeah, social media followings and stuff. I'm just thinking, like, if either one of them had to relate to another human personally, they'd probably relate more to each other despite their political differences than to a random person out of their voting pool. I don't know. No? Just because I think that their their political differences come to such a head in, like, terms of uh, emotional, um, like, vitriolic dislike, you know? Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's like, you know, if they're both stressed about something, are they going to go talk to each other? Are they going to go talk to their, their fans? Like, I think that they would find more like sympathy with like people, you know, who share their struggles and their concerns than like they would with each other. Well, that's the thing. They literally would never talk to their fans because their fans aren't in, you know, Washington DC in the Congress building, whereas they might talk to each other if they, you know, both went to get a pop at the same time. Like, Hey, Hey, how's the kids? Good. Okay, cool. Yours. I mean, See, that's 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 how I like to imagine it goes. I think that they actually you saw Veep, right? Yeah, yeah. I think it's more like that, where like they are childish and stupid. Yeah. But I'm told. But even those childish, stupid people have more in common with each other. They have more in common, but they wouldn't they wouldn't share pleasantries at the at the soda machine. They still like, usually pretended to share pleasantries. I think that uh, I've heard that's how the Supreme Court justices work. Yeah. Is that they they disagree obviously on stuff, mm-hmm. but they're perfectly amicable to each other, mm-hmm. and that's how I think I'd like it. You know, it's like, sure, we disagree, but, like, this is our job. Yeah. And then again, if you really thought somebody was doing something really, really terrible, mm-hmm. you know, like, you know, pe- people on one hand of the abortion debate really think that people are killing babies. And, then, you know, the same way as grabbing a newborn out of someone's arms and smashing it on the ground. Like, if you thought somebody was really doing that, you couldn't share pleasantries with them. You know, you couldn't invite them over to your lunch table. Like, so, and that that, that shouldn't be, that is a political argument, but that's more of, like, a scientific, dis- or that's more of, like, a reality disagreement. Yeah. But it's it's tied up in politics stuff. I don't I think, know. I think they overplay their dislike for each other. Maybe. I, th- I think they that's might. That's not true. But, but th- wouldn't that be fun, though? Is, like, once the cameras are off, they, like, high-five and, you know, <laughs> they leave. probably don't high-five. <laughs> no, but I'm trying to think of, like, uh, like some of it seems like it is, like, reality TV, right? Mm-hmm. But it's reality TV you're on all the time. Because mm-hmm. anyone around you could be videotaping you. And so... Maybe you do just play it up all the time, but you don't really hate them that much. I mean, you could legitimately hate how hard they make your job and how they're dragging the country in a way you don't like, but I think that's different from, like, a personal dislike. And they'd still have more in common with each other as people just because of their life situations, right? Have you ever worked with somebody that you hated or that you really, really disagreed with? And then you think about that versus, like, the person you sat next to on the train to go to work. You might agree with them more than the person that you work with, even though you have the same job. I mean, my sister comes to mind, even though I didn't work with her. That's a good example for me, too, actually. You'd think that we'd, have, we'd be super related, or yeah. relatable. Well, we are super related. Yeah. Uh, we're siblings, but uh, we don't relate to each other at all. Yeah. And we have a lot in common. Same parents and everything. Right, um, right. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I So I think, I, I bring that up because I think there is a threshold where you start identifying more with a random muggle that you just, you know, reach out the window and grab mm-hmm. than, than the person that you've been standing next to for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. It's, it's, I mean, this was certainly much more the case in 2007 where uh, history had still ended and the parties were much more similar than now where, you know, the, the fighting is between, between Americans. Yeah. If we had a, uh, an outside enemy to rally against, where's Dr. Manhattan when you need him? Where's that AI with the red glowing eyes and its army of robots? Man, 
you can imagine that like wouldn't be like the worst well it would be about the worst thing someone could do with an army of robots what's that like just unite humanity against killing them oh that's probably one of the best things you could do with an army of robots is well, unite humanity against you you could you could build all the things humanity needs and give it to them for free well okay instead. i mean sure yeah yeah so i mean it's definitely <laughs> down there on the list of things but it's not the worst thing you could do with them right yeah that's funny we live in a weird weird ape brains <laughs> so to eliezer's point he says suppose that you happen to be socially liberal fiscally conservative who would you vote for or simplified further suppose that you're a voter who prefers a smaller less expensive government should you vote republican or democratic or lest i be accused of color favoritism suppose you, that your voter preference is to get u.s troops out of iraq should you vote democratic or republican <laughs> And you should vote. I'll be back. Ask me again in 15 years. Uh. <laughs> and I mean, I think that makes this point swimmingly because uh, basically on every issue, neither party would do that. You, you couldn't vote for a smaller government. You couldn't vote for uh, getting troops out of Iraq because those simply weren't on the option. You but, uh, could either vote Democrat or Republican and neither of them was going to give you that. But ostensibly they are on the, like, they're, they're implied options for both, right? Republicans are small government. Liberals are not war. I mean, if you believe lies. Right. But, but you're supposed to believe the if, lies. That's why you're voting. But if you... Well, I, I think that's part of the two-party swindle that he's putting out here. Like, sure, if you believe lies, but uh, if you actually look at the truth, that you don't have an option to vote for someone that wants to do those things. See, I thought he was painting it as like, say you want both of these things, who do you vote for? Like, you're stuck. No, no if you want either one, you can't have them, because neither of the two options allows you to pick that. Well, I guess so. He was saying above, if you're socially liberal and fiscally conservative. That's true. Then you also have no one you can vote for. Yeah. Yeah, that's, I mean, the thing is, like, and I, I like the idea that this is more digging into the uh, the package fallacy, uh, or the package deal fallacy, than, like, trying to argue in favor of voting third party. Because, mm -hmm. um, like, I'm not an expert, and I don't pretend to be able to argue this is somebody who knows a lot and is very opinionated, but I'm pretty sure voting for third party is basically a waste. Mm -hmm. If you care about how things go in the, ne like the immediate future, um, it's a great signal that like, Hey, if we can get past double digits with only 20 more years of practice voting for third party, then we can start getting people to take 30 party more seriously. I mean, still, you, if you only break double digits, you're only still breaking double. You're not breaking into the 30 percentages that you need to start actually swaying stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, so like, unfortunately it's got, like to me, it is just like a, take the lesser the two you know the two options that you dislike and find the one that checks fewer boxes of i don't like this right mm. i mean i don't know who would you vote for if you wanted there to be greater opportunities for the poor liberals because they're all about giving away money right i'm uh, pretending like i don't know i but, mean <laughs> i mean the, the idea is that you know, I, my answer is no one because neither party gives a fuck i mean maybe you know one one party does try to pass like you know better food stamps bills and stuff right i don't think the food stamp bills really help and they help people also who use they food usually stamps. don't pass them well, they, they usually pass them because they get stopped by the other group that doesn't want them to pass yeah, the other group has other things like on net i don't think either party is helping poor people at all they're as much about fucking the poor people as helping them yeah you, i mean at the end of the day that might be how it's going i don't know i i disagree because i've heard this line of argument you know, everyone has, but hmm. well, they're but they're basically the same, just in different directions. And I kind of disagree. Okay. Like they're similar in different directions, but like I'm gonna, you know, my my tribal colors are hardly that. It's just that like it happens to be that one side is like pro science and one side isn't. Hmm. And I think that science is the thing that's gonna keep us from you know eating each other in 20 years. Which side do you think is the pro science side? The blue tribe. Okay. I mean, I, I think both of them are very anti science. I mean. Like Not, the the blue tribe has been telling us for a long time that the world is going to end within the next ten twenty years because it's going to catch on fire due to global warming, right? I mean, the fringes are always going to be going to be wrong, right? The, does the blue tribe not idolize what's her name Greta something Thurenberg? I think that they they like her. I think that I'd, I'd like people who like her more than people who give her shit on Twitter, especially if you're the fucking president. I but the, the blue people I saw either praised her or would say nothing about how she's completely destroying her life due to these crazy delusions oh so i don't know anything about what she's see that's the cool thing about not being in the news is i have no idea what anyone's up to i heard the name i remember she was around five years ago giving talks at like the un or something about 
climate change sucks. Can you not fuck us, please? Was basically her, her argument. Her argument was, we are literally all going to die in less than 10 years, and this is your fault. How dare you? Oh, that's funny. I heard the Steely Ann version of it, which is like, <laughs> y'all are fucking us, <laughs> and we're going to inherit your mess. Right, right. Which, that part's true. That... So I'll, st- I'll steal me on her for her, and say that that's... that's uh, so I, I like the case that agrees that, like, climate change is real, that... uh you know, evolutionary science is real and like you can do things with genetic research that are real. Um, you know, stem cells aren't, uh, sapient human beings that we need to be morally concerned about so we can use them to treat burn victims and paraplegics and stuff. Yeah, like, yeah. you know, th- there's, there's a whole litany of things and don't get me wrong. There's a whole list, list of downsides. I just feel like the pros outweigh the cons. Yeah. But you know, the second that the other side switches what they're what they care about to things that I like more. I'm gonna switch. That's that's why like I'm not a, I'm registered independent. Yeah. Uh, but like the more I don't know, just the more they have the more anti science censorship I saw from the blue tribe. The more I was like, oh okay, they don't actually care about science. They just like the things that support their soldiers. And the second the science doesn't support their soldiers anymore, they're happy to push it under the bus. I think, like, if you ignore, like, the couple of hot-button issues that they're probably, like, throwing under the bus because they want to get reelected. I mean, um, if you, sure, if you ignore the places where they're wrong about stuff, then they're never wrong, but... But, like, so, say if they're... That's true of any political party. Say if they're wrong about, like, uh, I don't know, it's probably a political opinion about, like, uh, whether or not, uh, what do you call it, puberty blockers? Mm-hmm. Like, it's probably a political opinion that whether or not they have any negative side effects right. is true or false. Right. Like, so uh, I, I'm sure that some people on the pro puberty blocker side are like, they're literally zero downsides. Yes. And so, but they're I just, have heard those exact words, but they're just wrong. Yes. I assume. And I yeah. don't, I know that having done no research because it's a drug. <laughs> right. Every drug has downsides. Uh-huh. Every drug gives you headaches and you shouldn't operate a vehicle while taking it. Right. 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 So like at the very least, uh, they, they're, they're wrong as a matter of just like, basically a priori guess right Mm -hmm. um but i guess i'm saying is like you weigh that wrong opinion that they might be on and this is mostly hypothetical because i'm not actually informed yeah but you weigh that wrong opinion that they're on about this one niche issue and compare that to like you know lying about oh yeah we're burning clean coal not the not the bad kind i mean if you're trying to convince me that republicans are a lot worse you don't have to because i already agree with that and especially since one of my biggest issues uh is is abortion rights uh i you know i i think that is just a huge thing which is always going to get my vote uh in support of abortion rights but i'm also not deluding myself i i i don't there is no party i can vote for that um thinks that abortion should be an unrestricted right to everybody no, but why would you let the perfect be the enemy of the good there? I mean, like, I don't. There, there's one There's one group that says, we'll let you do it for 20 weeks or something. Yeah. And another group that says, fuck you, you can't do it. You can't even go to another state and do it. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, yeah, you're right there. But also, what if I was against the war in Iraq? I literally couldn't vote for a party that was against it unless I went third party. Right. That, that, that That's a good point. And I, you know, I think that... What if I was against bailing out banks and expanding the government another $3 trillion? literally can't vote against that i think that maybe and this this is definitely probably true of my vote even though i don't really talk about what i vote for except for right now um hmm. for the most part it's like signal and tribe affiliation you know favorite sports team stuff right mm-hmm. because most of the time you don't get to pick what you want and most of the time what you're picking you don't have like a heavy influence over right but there is something about like if one side gets and you know we can just paint it as like cartoonish characters of both sides actually if we take the cartoonish characters characterizations of both sides they both kind of suck huh mm-hmm. i think one does suck more than the other i agree so i would take one dystopia over another kind of nine times out of probably ten times out of ten but that's again taking the, the, the like the most extreme version yeah all righty uh we got we got way off, but that was okay because that was fun. That was fun. Yeah. Uh, Eliezer does say, here's a part I disagree with him. There isn't a grand conspiracy to expand the government, but there is an incentive for each individual politician to send pork to campaign contributors to borrow today against tomorrow's income. And that creates a divide between the politicians and the voters as a class for reasons that have nothing to do with colors and slogans. Uh, I mean, I agree with him that that is happening a lot, but I don't think that that, that creates a divide between politicians and voters because... Voters love pork for themselves. <laughs> I, I I've never seen a voter 
that's not true. I rarely see the voting public be against uh, more money being doled out to them. Yeah. Did anyone not cash their whatever COVID stimulus checks out of principle? Right. Yeah. That's a real question. Oh, um, I mean, probably, probably somebody, somebody, but like yeah. some crazy people, right? Yeah, right At yeah. the very least, you're like, this is wrong. I'm going to cash it and spend it in a way that needs to be spent. Mm. Or it's like, you guys are idiots, you know, but it's free money. Um, I think a lot of this is due in part to the loss of trust in government. Like, if there was a time where you thought the government was working for the betterment of the entire society, you'd be like, yeah, okay, I'm willing to pay extra taxes that I don't see benefit for because it's benefiting the society which benefits me you know as well but if you're like the government is incompetent and just fucks everything up then whenever the government is like here's some money you're like give me some of that money the only thing you're good for is taking money and then giving it back so give me some of it and uh why why wouldn't you vote for more for you because it looks like just a giant redistribution scheme that benefits some people at your expense yeah i i don't know i mean I I, get, I see what you're saying. Hmm. It's just funny because like, I guess I'm not sure what he's what what is the divide he's saying that is created. I, I think what um, he's what he's thinking of is that the people as a whole want a better, more functional government, and the government just wants to keep on ship out pork to yeah, so that so that they, that they get um, benefits. And I don't think it's the case anymore that people want a better more functional government and want to work for the greater good of society maybe maybe i am just becoming jaded in my old age here <laughs> maybe people really are better than that and still do have some faith in the system to to make things better for everyone i don't know i mean the both of those things can be true right people having faith and you know the system not being that way so i mean well you, you said majority you said, you said people might have faith in it uh actually doing the thing not actually doing the thing Right. Yeah. And so you you can have it both ways. You know, you can say, actually, I just see past the past the lie. You guys can are free to have your hope, though. Um, <laughs> but that might be old old cynicism. Who knows? Like I, I think I mean as a majority, because once the majority of the people all lose faith in the government, then you know you just get expectation of corruption and incompetence. I was wrong. Congress people make one hundred one hundred seventy four thousand dollars a year. Okay. What's funny is that. You want to guess what it was in 1786 or 1789? I believe it was zero dollars, right? Six dollars. Oh, six dollars? Okay. I guess this is when they started doing a salaries. Yeah. Oh, wait. In 2020 dollars, though, that was 130 bucks. That's still nothing. That's still nothing. Yeah. yeah. That's pretty funny. Oh, this is disappointing and weird. Uh, <laughs> in 2009, they made $174,000, which in today's money is $209,000. Oh, so it's been going down. <laughs> Today they make one hundred twenty four thousand dollars, which today is worth one hundred twenty four thousand dollars. Yeah, <laughs> it's not that they're making less; it's that money's worth less. That's the disappointing part. Yeah. All right. Um, Anyways, his grand point here is that the two party swindle is basically the political teams are like sports teams, getting emotional over politics as though it were a sports game. Identifying with one color and screaming cheers for them while heaping abuse on the other colors' fans is a very good thing for the professional players team, not so much for team voters. I can see that. Oh, and that that might be a, so. Imagine. If we stretch the sports analogy to where, like, the more the sports fans hated each other, mm -hmm. um, like, the more stuff they, the more money they spent buying jerseys and tailgating and whatever, tickets, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, you can imagine a weird perverse incentive where, like, the, the sports administration fosters discontent among the fans, yeah. right? To keep them hating each other so they buy more stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I will just take the point that he makes there, which is, like, Getting emotional over politics as though it were a sports game, uh, screaming cheers for one team and heaping abuse in the other. He might he says it's a good thing for professional players' teams, not for the not for the voters. I would just say like that's just not a happy way to live. Like, and nine ninety nine times out of a hundred, you're not going to make the world a better place by heaping abuse on anybody. And like, you know, there are people I know who are you know, and I, I'm not like vehemently. I, I never. I don't think I. I might come off uncharitable to some people. Like, you know, I don't think that there's even, like, the best case in favor of Donald Trump was very compelling, which is my nice way of saying that I think you're an idiot if you think he was a great president. <laughs> yeah. um, but, like, I know people who liked him as a president. I, I love people who liked him as a president. Yeah. Not all of them, but there are people I, you know, so it's like, yeah. I guess I'm saying is, like, at the end of the day, and you want to know how, how often that comes up, like, in our day-to-day -day lives, like, how much those political differences make an impact? Mm. It's like zero. 
Right. And that that's true of all of your political beliefs, basically. Yeah. You know, short of like, I don't know, not like if you were in an active shooter situation and you weren't allowed to bring your gun or you were allowed to bring your gun, mm-hmm. like that would be a thing where like your politics actually mattered. But frankly, that's not politics. That's just your own personal security choices. And I know it comes to, like it's argued in politics, yeah. but maybe it's because I don't know what politics is. Like everything I, I I boil down to like, no, that's actually just like politics is things like distant immigration control, like border control, right? I mean, it's that too, but it's also where are you allowed to take your gun? Yeah. And, you know, there's probably reasonable restrictions on that, right? Um, maybe there's not. Some people might argue. I, I, I'm safe. I'm safest and everyone else around me is safest wherever I have my gun. Right. Um, right. But you might just be able to say like, I don't know. It seems like, it seems like inviting trouble if you say we're allowed to bring them into banks. Because like then you're you're not breaking the law until you pull it out and point it at the clerk. But if we can stop you at the door with your gun, you can't come in and rob the bank, yeah. you know? Yeah. But uh, like, like border control, stuff like that, that doesn't impact anybody directly. Like unless you work at the border, like unless it's your job to, to, to drive a, a Jeep back and forth and look for people. Like well, it changes who else is in the country, but that almost never impacts anyone's day to day. Like, it depends on how close you live to the border. I, yeah, I suppose so. It and probably I, I, doesn't I've affect heard, people in Minnesota, but it affects a lot of people like in Arizona and Texas. I've heard tell that, you know, people come in and, and take low-skill jobs or something because they can do it without paperwork and whatever. But, like, and I'm sure that happens. I guess I don't want to dismiss it, but, like, I guess I don't know anyone in those places, mm-hmm. right? Or right. at least not personally that closely. Mm-hmm. But I do know people who care a lot about border control, and it's not impacting them. Mm-hmm. And maybe they care about it for the same reason that, like, I care about abortion rights. You know, and right. I care about that as a guy in Colorado. No yeah. one, my, my abortion rights aren't affected because I never had any. Mm-hmm. And nobody I know are affected because they're all in Colorado. Where yeah. it's still the same as it was, you know, a year ago. Yeah. And so maybe I'm, I guess I get being passionate about it for reasons that like it's beyond your personal scope. Maybe I'm thinking too narrowly. Mm-hmm. But I guess, you know, like I'm not happy with the abortion decision either, right? Yeah. But, like, I'm also not losing sleep over it. Right. But that might be because it's not impacting me. Maybe I just, like, you know, don't have the emotional tuned-in factor there. I mean, I'm not losing sleep over it either because, like you say, we're in one of the safe states. Uh, we Our rights haven't changed at all. And you can't get anyone pregnant. <laughs> and, well, it, that too, yes. But, yeah. I mean, I know people who can get pregnant. So, yeah, it, it could... I mean, it can't affect my life in Colorado. But if I knew people in other states, which technically I do. So, you know... Yeah, I mean, I guess, I don't know then. I, I'm, I'm wondering, I, I'm kind of just noodling on this because maybe I've taken my political apathy too far. Yeah. And this is not the worst time to discuss that. But I mean, like, I, I'm much more of a federalist nowadays where I think different states should be allowed to have different laws and people move freely between them. But like moving from one state to another is like it's, not something that everyone can do. Right. And so the, it, it sucks because like, on the one hand, I can see the the case for that, and people talk about some some people are like flippant and like, well, just get up and move. And it's like, what do you mean, just? It's like, yeah. are you going to pay for like a moving truck for me to take two weeks off of work yeah. for me to find put a, a new put, job, put, find a new job, put a deposit on a place? Yeah. Like, no, then fuck you. You can't tell me just to do anything. Also, blue states tend to be very expensive to move into. Yeah, and judgmental once you get here. For some reason, <laughs> Coloradoans are all about like native. You know, I was born here, fuck you, kind of, you know, huh. we, we have license plates that say Colorado Native, you know, like. I mean, I guess I've seen those, yeah. yeah. I, is that a big thing? I haven't. I don't know if it's a big thing, but it's know. it's a thing that people pretend to care about. Okay, okay. Um, if you go to like r slash Denver, people are always shitting on people coming in from out of out of town, but that's also Reddit where people I think are being funny on purpose. Okay. They're, but, it, you know, they're not being Denver circle jerk funny. They're being, you know, like, oh, those, those out-of-towners, they all suck at driving. It's hmm. like. I don't know if they all suck at driving. I mean, my solution is not to go to r slash Denver. Yeah. No, I'm just saying, like, if you want to get your pulse on how people feel about Colorado Natives or whatever. Yeah. But I'm, I'm kind of rambling at this point. No, no, no. I it's guess cool. I, I'm still, I don't know. Part of me wonders, like, so when, when the Roe decision came down, I was, I was thinking about that. Like, do I, am I only, like, not moved by this because of my lack of personal stakes in it? Mm-hmm. And that's no doubt part of it, just because how could it not be? But then I started to think, like, what could possibly come come down from the government that I would feel a reaction towards? Mm-hmm. Like, that that's not a, that's that's not rhetorical. I was trying to think of actual examples, and it's like I'm already signed up for non voluntary service um, if we get drafted. Okay. So like, if they said 
whatever you're now going to be signed up for, you know you're you're now non you're now conscripted and it's like yeah, i already knew that was a possibility that sucks but like i'm already aware of that All right um like what else what else could come down government wise that would like anything that could freak you out in a way that you know women are very understandably freaked out about their lack of abortion access uh they could make various religions mandatory they could implement religious laws they could start wars with foreign governments especially nuclear armed ones uh there's yeah there's a lot of things the government could do that would be terrible maybe i just maybe they i just think that like ruinous taxes on everybody i guess taxes would be harder to avoid but like if it was like you have to go to this religion and stuff you could just fake it or lie you know i mean that'd be a lot like driving across the border to get you know across the state border to get an abortion how do and you how do you fake wearing a burqa all the time if you're outside i mean i don't think that that could realistically pass but you're right that that's that's not a bad example i mean so i don't know i guess you dissent and go to jail yeah i don't know that's weird <laughs> it's, i mean that that's even worse than moving to another state man yeah I, I, I was just trying to think of like how do i answer that question and i imagine like not doing it that's what would happen so i was more admitting defeat okay, um, okay. yeah i don't know i'll uh i'll have to think about it anyway i'm sure that the, i'm sure probably I mean, sometime in the last five minutes this went from fun rambling to pointless rambling so i, th- I think i mean basically I think the post agrees with you. The post is saying getting people emotionally involved in fighting in the red versus blue wars is really good for the red and blue politicians and is basically completely inconsequential to the the voters themselves. So I think you were arguing the pro Yudkowsky side in this whole time for some reason I was like, but I'm part of the two party swindle. Don't don't take away my my caring about politics. So I don't um, know. There, there might be, there might be a balance between the two positions. You know, there might be also if the world as we know it is going to end in twenty years. How much can really go wrong in that time? Maybe a lot. Maybe that's a compelling point. I don't know, man. Like, uh, uh, yeah. I mentioned animal, like long term animal rights activism. Mm-hmm. I just listened to an interview on the Lex Friedman podcast, which is like imagine Joe Rogan, but if Joe Rogan were an AI, AI researcher instead of you know a meathead who can have engaging but kind of like uninformed arguments or mm-hmm. discussions. Mm-hmm. Lex, Lex Friedman is like, he is an AI researcher version of that. It's, it's a lot of fun. Cool. But he's friends with Rogan and he's chill as fuck. He talks with everyone that, you know, he can get his hands on. Um, he was talking with somebody whose name I can't remember and I can't find the thing. I thought it was more, one of the more recent ones, but it must have been from before and I'd had it like saved or something. Okay. So it was with somebody who works at an animal rights organization. Mm-hmm. And... Uh, it was a it was a great interview, but she talked about being motivated by like very very strongly motivated by her emotions and like because she really cares about the animals that she's trying to help. Mm-hmm. And she says I actually keep that in check with all of this like rationality and logic. Mm-hmm. And so like you know because I, so I guess what I'm going to get is like that that might be the way to do it. Like you actually do really care, but you don't let that get in the way of doing things most effectively. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so per that, if you're really invested in a political position or stance or or outcome like maybe keep those motions in check you know have them it's perfectly appropriate and, and human but like if you if you can kind of control yourself then you're able to um what am i trying to say uh win more battles like yeah. you know have you ever changed your mind on something never never i, I was right from the day i was born but if you had it <laughs> might have been because somebody like talked to you calmly approach you know yeah. in, in, a, in a nice human way you probably never changed your way i'm willing to guess because someone got in your face and yelled at you and called you a fucking moron probably not no that was kind of the one of those things that would probably caused me to dig in my heels so that might be good advice and that that's like that's maybe the, the happy balance between these right yeah um like by all means be driven this is important if you're not emotionally maybe i'm broken because i'm not emotionally engaged by this stuff and that's fine um but be emotionally engaged about it, but maybe do check it so that you can win more battles rather than just like win more arguments. You know, I think my emotional engagement with it is why I've become so disgusted over the past five years with all of it. The, I think that's understandable. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyways, we, we got really way into politics. Oh, Hey, if you want politics every two weeks, uh, we, me and Wes and David tackle the uh, rationalist view on the politics of the day, the the news of the day, rather, uh, some of which is political, uh, on the Mind Killer podcast, which I will link right here. Do check it out. It's fun. Yes. That is my main source of news. I don't oh, know cool. if Wes has been told that directly, but yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't look at the news. 
It's mm. it's all gonna bum me out. There's no nothing I can do about it. But I like hearing your guys' takes on stuff. So that's how I stay in the loop on things. Yeah. Ooh, I'm gonna cut this out. But did you hear the most recent one? Mm-hmm. And you heard about the the guy that saved the 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 little girl in the burning house? Yeah. What did what did you feel about like when David and Wes asked me? So how do you feel about masculinity now? I don't remember what your answer was. I think you you were kind of you gave that kind of expression and kind of like demurred, right? Yeah, I was like, uh, I, I I'm not against masculinity. I I'm against me, but I, you know, like I I I guess I've given off the impression that I hate masculinity or something, and I don't. You definitely have said that in as many words on blog posts, like I, that you've I, bought you've bought the the sales pitch that men suck. Men suck, yeah, not necessarily masculinity, just men. Okay, uh, well, I guess I'm not sure what the difference is. But A, you should love yourself because, you, you know, but we can fight that battle another time. Yeah. Um, I mean, you're right. There is something more 300 about that than like like what the movie 300, right? Yeah, yeah. Kicking the door in and jumping out of a fucking burning building. Yeah. That seems like a very like hair on your chest kind of thing, right? That was badass. Um, so, I don't know. I mean, but it, you, it, was you also could... an, it was also an opportunity that the guy had and no one else was around to do, right? Yeah. Could have been a female delivery driver. Might have done the same thing. Yeah, yeah. Would have been masculine if she did it. I don't know. It's just nice. Yeah. <laughs> it's just heroic. But I do give off the impression of not liking that kind of thing. No. That's no. Uh, that's why I think they knew that it was a, a joke, a, like, jab that they would win. Because okay. who could not like that kind of thing? Right. Yeah. So yeah. Okay. I think what they were saying is, like, the way that I took it was, like, this is a... Um, you know, you know all the toxic masculinity shit that you're against, which we're all against. Yeah, well, yeah. this is an example of that in practice. This but it's person, not. Put, it's not exactly. Yeah. That's why it's, that's I took it as a joke. Okay, okay. And so, like, they look at that, and be like, look, what could be more more toxically masculine than like risking <laughs> your life and look, you know, trying to look like a badass doing it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, I, so I, I thought that they were. I took it as a complete joke. Okay. Um, but maybe it wasn't. I mean, it was. It was at least partly a joke. Maybe mostly a joke. I was I was just taken aback by it because I didn't realize I gave off that kind of vibe. Let's talk more about it after because I'm I'm yeah, rushing my brain because uh, a we're you know burning through memory on your computer and b I really have right. to pee so. Okay, um, do we want to thank a patron for this crazy BS non episode, or is that would that be an insult to the patron? Patron, you're out of luck. We're gonna get sh- we're gonna give you a shout out for this one. Okay. This week it is Divinity. Sweet, thank you, Divinity. The end of the world is coming, and we feel fine, and we hope you do too. Whether you like it or not, this episode couldn't have happened without you. So thank you very much. That's right. We hope you liked it. Yes. Uh, and we we thank everybody for listening and for helping support us. Rate and review us. Tell about us to other people. Or tell other people about us. There we go. Uh, do all those things. and um, Do relax and have fun no matter what it is you're doing. If you're saving the world or not. That's right. There's always time to take care of yourself and, and have some enjoyment. Yeah. You won't be able to keep saving the world if you bring yourself out. So don't do that. That's right. Awesome. Go team. All right. Peace out. See ya.